Northwest Meeting to order of May 10th, November 8th, 2011. Uh, the, uh, welcome everybody here. What a crowd. Uh, I, I'm not, I've looked at the agenda and I've looked at the crowd and I'm still trying to figure out why everybody's here, but it's really great to see everybody. Uh, and we'll, uh, we're going to proceed slowly and the reason we're going to proceed slowly is we're trying to buy time for the, for the uh, chairman to arrive. Uh, but we do have uh, only one one real announcement, I think, unless the any of the commissioners have, and that is to uh, welcome Ms. Lori Hall as our new finance director. We are thrilled to death, thrilled to death to have you here, and uh, uh, especially on this half of the room, because those of you that may not know, they don't put you on this half of the room by accident. They put you over here because you don't know anything about finance, and you get to sit next to the finance director. So <laughs> I used to sit here. <laughs> I used to sit here, and then when Kevin came, I graduated to the next chair over. So it is, uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, welcome to Macon County, and we look forward to a long, uh, a long and uh, prosperous uh, relationship here. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other uh, announcements by any of the uh, board members? I had a very pleasant meeting with the governor on Friday. Uh, we talked about economic incentives maybe for the west end of the state. Uh, we passed along a lot of things this board has discussed to the governor. Uh, she seemed receptive but did not give us a check. <laughs> so, uh, so we had a good meeting and uh, just let her just let them all remember where we're still at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we did have our, our um, triannual. Is that what it is? I don't know, how, what, I don't know what word that is. Three, Three times a year we meet with the uh, municipalities and the uh, and the county. Uh, this meeting was up in Highlands. It was a, a really good meeting. A lot of uh, a lot of good things going on between the towns and the county. And and I think those meetings are very important because what they do is they keep the dialogue open between three layers of government that quite honestly are not going to survive in the future without each other. Uh, it's absolutely essential that the towns and the counties seek common ground, that they seek common solutions to complex problems, and it's meetings like that. We're one of the few counties that actually does this on a regular basis. It's been very, very productive, and, uh, and, and it was a terrific meeting. I want to thank, even though I don't see many of them here, I want to thank the folks up in Highlands who just put on a tremendous uh, event that evening and uh, we just got a lot done a lot of a lot of good uh, discussion a lot of reports on where everybody's going and and uh really worked out well so i just want to thank the uh, mayor of Highlands and uh and uh town board up there for, for hosting us up there and i guess the next one is on us isn't it? Yeah. The next one's on the county so we'll have to we'll have to get on uh, mr vice chairman that was a phone call from brian he is very close he said about three minutes away so very well and that'll time it out we timed it out just about perfect uh, what I'd like to do now is move on to the invocation. We'd like to ask the Reverend Eddie Trump if he would pray for us. Let's stand. Thank you. Father, I'm glad that I can voice this prayer on behalf of all the people gathered in this room. I think the neatest thing is that you created everything, everything exists. You are before all things. All things hold together by the power of your word. And yet you and your, your love have offered to us the opportunity to know you, to be loved by you and to love you, and to have a very intimate relationship with you that's built on your love and your grace. Father, I'm thankful that you've given us the gift of friends and family and governments and structures and uh, institutions. Father, I pray that we'll always keep in mind that if we're looking for someone with authority, it's you. If we're looking for someone with power, it'd be you. If we're looking for someone with knowledge, it'd be you. If we're looking for wisdom, it'll come from you. Father, just help us to remember who you are, who we are, and I always know the difference. I ask all this in the blessed name of Jesus for our sins. Amen. Amen. 
had it not been for those, some of these folks, we would not even be having this discussion about retaining such a special building. This would cost a special people. Uh, I've asked some folks to attend tonight uh, under the disguise that we need to ask some questions about the building. Uh, there's a lot of family here to recognize these two people. We're very fortunate to make the can to have strong communities and to have strong people in who for generations have told without recognition. This couple don't want to recognize yeah. And uh, so with that, I would like to ask Don and Dorothy C to please approach the podium and Kevin if you would join me. Siegel yeah, has been a, if you don't know Don Siegel, he's not only been an educator for all of his life, the assistance he's given many young people throughout Macon County, not only his community, but we talked about this building. He said, Ron, we will never get anything money to fix it. We will never get, yes, we will, Don. It just took, what, six, seven years, but we're, we're right now there. But it's with special gratitude and thanks not only from this Board of County Commissioner, folks gathered here, but the citizens of Macon County that we're so proud to present this to folks who strengthen our county and strengthen our community. This is in grateful recognition to Don and Dorothy Siegel for years of outstanding service to the Holly Springs community and to Macon County. And there have been more true words spoken. And we appreciate you so much. this single family, the matriarchs of this family and the family standing behind them, not only are they supportive of the community in any way possible, but we're so proud and there's going to come a time, folks, when we don't have the opportunity to recognize these folks. So this is a great chance for us to do that tonight. Smile, Dawn, like you <laughs> Now, Donnie would not be appropriate for all this without you saying something. <coughs> okay, I'd like to say this. In recognition of all the commissioners that have helped us during the last 10, 12, 15 years, and especially this group that is in the uh, office right now, we appreciate your efforts and we have been proven that uh, this group of men right now have had a great uh, energy in our community and then what we are doing and we support our uh, local government and our commissioners 100% and we look forward to the improvement uh, and we will be using them for years to come. 
appreciate everything that you have done. And we hope that uh, in years to come, we will still be there pushing and trying to have it be better. Thank you. Lots of room now. Oh, she's out there. Oh, she, uh, <laughs> Dorothy did, and it, the scoops 
<laughs> right, but somebody that was out there when I was out there last time said they went to school. I Tex Corbin was there. He went to school there. And uh, Carol. Carol went to school there. So there's a lot of history. There's a lot of history out there that we're happy to be a, a small part of preserving. We, we really appreciate because we had a bus driver give us a coat of money to bus started off. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right, we'll we'll continue on. We have a uh, we don't have a public here, but we got public comment. We do have two people uh, that are signed up to speak about the. Uh, Swimming area in Nanahala. If you would prefer, if it's okay with everyone, we can you can hold your comments until we discuss that topic, or if you prefer, you can go ahead and speak now. Uh, that's uh, Jeff Cohen and Martha Cohen. Would you prefer to speak now? Or the only reason I have to is I've still got to go to work. Will you come on up? Thank you for all that. Here. Um, yes, sir. Thank you all for letting us talk and for having us here. Uh, my name is Jeff Cohen. I've lived in Macon County now for 17 years, full time. I've uh, been part time in Nanahala since 2004. And in 2007, I've been up there full time. That's where I reside. I live not too far down from the public boat ramp. The other thing I want to say you know, a lot of people grew up hunting and fishing. I didn't get that opportunity, but my opportunity growing up is I lived on the water my most of my life. I've boated most of my life. And I've seen people with boats, what happens with boats and people swimming generally don't get together. Uh, it, it comes right down to this, it's a safety issue. Anytime you put people swimming next to boats, the boat's gonna win and the people are gonna lose. Last year I went out in my little boat and I have to pass the public ramp. And I saw what I thought was a duck being an animal lover, I kept my idle speed down. That duck turned out to be a little girl swimming across from the public boat man. This unsupervised little girl swimming across the channel. Now, I cannot tell you the times that I have watched people put boats in at that public boat ramp, and there's a sign that says, slow, no wake. Those three words are totally not abided by. People will launch, They'll get clear of the boat ramp, and they're gone. Same way when they come in. They'll come in the jet skis, uh, full speed. They slow down maybe when they get to the sign. It's just not safe. Uh, you know, they, they talk about, and I've never seen the an accident after accident of a boat hitting somebody, but I've seen pictures of manatees, and that's pretty ugly. You see pictures of whales. So think about what's going to happen to somebody when they get hit by a boat. That's my main concern, is the kids, the safety. Okay, now, if that little girl was swimming out there, who was supposed to be watching her? There was nobody there watching that little girl. Well, if they were, they sure weren't watching them close enough. Okay? The added thing is with boating, and that's the problem here with Macon County, the boats and alcohol. They don't go together, but unfortunately, people get on that lake, and especially around the July 4th weekend, and there's a lot of alcohol consumed. 
Uh, it's just not safe. If you're going to have a swimming area in Nat Hill, it has got to be away from boats. There absolutely cannot be any boats around there. All right? Uh, you know, the people, when they buy boats, they don't, especially if they're adults, they don't need a license. It is so dangerous what people will do with those things. They have no idea of the rules of the roads uh, with boats. It's just dangerous. And that's all I'm going to say about that. The other thing is if you have a swimming area, are we then going to put up lighting for at night? <coughs> this is especially near the public boat ramp. Is it going to have bathrooms? Who's going to ping the bathrooms? Who's going to supervise? Are you going to have a lifeguard or no lifeguard? You've got the boat ramp for the uh, dock. Have you ever seen a kid that sees a dock and is not going to run down that dock and jump in? I don't think so. If there's a dock, you can have an area here that's designated for swimming, and they might swim off of that area. But if a teenager sees a dock, he's going off. That's all there is to it. Anybody says that that's not true, I can see it from my house. I mean, they're looking full speed and having a good time. Thankfully, I don't think there's been any serious accidents up there. And most of the people I do see up there are family people. And unfortunately, there is no swimming area there. <coughs> um, you know, y'all, we're talking about handicap accessible to the Holly Springs area. Are you then going to make the swimming area handicap accessible? Are you going to put bathrooms in there handicap accessible? Those are all funds. That's just money we're talking about. So if you put one in, those are still things you're going to have to address. But the biggest thing, uh, here, here's another thing, law enforcement. Every now and then you'll see an officer up there from Fish and Wildlife giving tickets to people swimming. <coughs> I have seen just twice this year, as far as somebody from Fish and Wildlife, I'm sure they're up there more patrolling the water, as far as in a boat. So there's really nobody there. It's like there's more enforcement to keep the kids and keep people and families from swimming than there is as far as keeping the boats from speeding. Well, just can't stress it enough. It, it, it's just not <coughs> enough. It's eight minutes probably before an ambulance get there and it's a 20 minute ride to town if somebody gets it by a boat. That's all, that's all I'm really going to say. It's just not safe. Okay, I've lived on the water my whole life. I see what alcohol and boating does, and there's plenty of it up there. And the other thing you're going to have up there is garbage. I mean, Anna Hill, I think, is in the top three cleanest lakes in the eastern half of the U.S., what I've been told. The amount of garbage that people will throw there is amazing. You just go to any of the little islands out on Anna Hill where people camp, and they're strewn with garbage. So somebody's going to have to put up garbage cans and hope that people use them. Thank you for just listening to me. Thank you, very Thank, you. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Thank you. We have uh, Martha Cohen. <coughs> I'm his wife. Yes, ma'am. Um, we have been involved in the community since we got here. We're not locals, and I'm always a little envious when I see these families who've been here forever because we love the Um We work with over 300 kids a week. We know how kids act. We live kitty corner down the ways in the cove of the public boat ramp. You know, you own, they own the gymnastics. We own the vision gymnastics. So we work with 300 plus kids every week. We know kids. And we have seen, I have sat on my dock day after day in the summertime and watched what goes on at that boat launch. It is a disaster waiting to happen. It's not that I'm not opposed to a swimming area. I've never been opposed to it. I, I am a little concerned about money because we don't want to be like the federal government in Macon County. Uh, unless we're rolling in dough, I can't see how we can really afford to, to do it and do it right. You guys like to do things right, and I appreciate that. But um, bottom line is we have seen kids push each other off the dock. I've seen a dog get run over by a propeller. It is really, really scary. Come to my house, I invite any one of you and sit for a whole Friday or Saturday and watch what happens there. You would never mix the colors of children. Put it somewhere else. Do it, but don't do it there. Thank you very much. 
this project we understood there were some issues and we hired a national geotechnical engineer firm and also a local engineer firm to help with this project. We've also been working closely with the county uh, to eliminate any concerns and to correct any problems that they saw. We came to the planning board with engineered plans for a new road at Thompson Road. We were approved and we built that road with several site inspections by the county. We then again came to the board to add some lots around the clubhouse, which would fall under the new <coughs> ordinance. We stood in front of the planning board, gave full disclosure on our intentions for the property, and asked if anyone had any concerns about our project to let us know. We also invited every single one on the planning board to come to our project. Derek Rowan, Matt Mason, Jimmy C, and Lewis Penlin were the only ones that came to our development. Al Slagle and Susan Irwin did not come and to my knowledge had not been on this development ever. But yet, they are conducting themselves as experts on this particular development and represent this county's interests. Sadly, today, I had to release a homeowner from his contract. He was heartbroken because he and his wife had always wanted to go in the Western Carolina Mountains for their second home. After years of searching, they found their dream lot on our property. And he was kind enough to put why he wanted to release out his contract in writing. He stated that he spoke to Al Slagle, who was on the planning board and represent your county's interests. Al Slagle said, good luck getting insurance as companies won't insure anything in Wildflower. Susan Irvin also made these comments about all of Ultima's developments that span over four counties in Western Carolina. I really find it hard to believe that any insurance company is going to single out just those developments. Al Slagle said, no builders will build in Wildflower. We have houses. Al Slagle said, Many roads are unstable and lots unsafe to build on. Where are the facts? Al Slagle said, I would not build there. And lastly, Al Slagle said, we, the county, have issues with the new developer. After releasing him from the lot, he comments to me this afternoon, Macon County is obviously anti-development, and he said, I have never seen a county representative make these kinds of vicious allegations. It appears the Planning and Zoning Board wants to make a spectacle of this. He told me he felt sorry for us on the county's attitude because we do have a beautiful development. Best of luck is what he told me this afternoon when we ended our call. Not only is this torturous interference with a contract, but the problem in lies where we have 151 current lot and homeowners in the development. And as you know, earlier in October, we sold 43 more. Right now, the property owners, the 151, with Jeanette that has been handling the property for five years, 
they're all scared to build because they are afraid the county will condemn their property. Al Slagle and Susan Irwin are devaluing their property by making accusations of bad roads and a bad development without having current facts. We sold 64 lots in Diamond Falls in October of last year. Do you know we have 12 houses being built? We are creating jobs in this county in a bad economy. We have local jobs. We are putting local people to work. This year, we sold 43 lots in the ridges at Wildflower. We have five. Okay. Oh, okay. We have five that have indicated they want to start building. I have come here to get your advice and help. If there are any issues that you have with us or the development, I would very much like to sit down with you guys and get this resolved and put it behind us. We are doing the right thing and we need this nonsense to, nonsense to stop and only you can help us. Thank you.
pretty confident.
warranted council update. Not necessarily not term limits, but just an update to warranted council. Yeah, to be clear, I wasn't actually speaking on behalf of the council. Right. <laughs> I we wasn't approved to, to do that. We got to, we got to, <laughs> any other uh, additions uh, or adjustments to the agenda? Chairman, if the appropriate place, uh, the key emergency management has uh, brought before the county commissioners and the multi jurisdictional hazard plan and mitigation plan. And the commissioners indeed approved that. It was not done by resolution. trying to steal anybody's thunder. I'm glad you're here. Uh, anybody wants to jump in there to help me, I'm glad to see you. Um, I think we need to put some rumors to bed. I think we need to calm some things down. Um, if anybody thinks we're putting the swimming area in at the boat ramp anytime in the next millennia, you're wrong. Okay? That ain't happening. Uh, and and, and I, I, I kind of knew that wasn't happening. But we have not we have not broached that issue once. We've broached it twice. The owners of that particular stretch of land is a group called the Wildlife Resources Commission. Wildlife Resources Commission uh, basically is a group, and they're, as, as, as Mr. Christofferson put it to me, standing on the dock in the rain about two weeks ago, uh, our, your constituents are the people of Nantahala, my constituents are the voters and the fishermen of North Carolina. And we own the property, and we will not endorse any activity which does not support fishing and boating safety. That was pretty clear to me, and I think it was pretty clear to anybody standing on the dock that it wasn't happening at the boat ramp. Uh, that's not to say it isn't happening at all. That is not to say we are not looking at other areas. We, in fact, are. And there's two areas right now, and we've got them in order. We're going we're gonna to slug through them one thing at a time. But what I want everybody to understand, whether you're from Manahela or whether you're not, whether you're, whether, whether you're like this initiative or whether you don't, Okay, what makes Nanahala Lake difficult is the number of shareholders that there are around the lake. First of all, mythology number one is you can't swim in Nanahala Lake. Sure you can. You can swim in Nanahala Lake anywhere you can get access to Nanahala Lake. The problem is there are so many different shareholders and private property owners that it's very difficult to get access to Nanahala Lake. The only place you can't is where the Wildlife Resources Commission says you can't swim here i.e. the boat ramp, or the U.S. Forest Service says you can't swim or fish here, or Duke Power says you can't swim or fish here. That's three pretty tough hombres when you're sitting here trying to figure out how you're going to put people in Nanahale Lake. So, we are still doing battle. Uh, we have a couple of areas, one of which we don't own, and I don't even like to jump out there and talk about it because it would cost money to even just purchase it, and I'm not sure that we have the access that we need even if we were to purchase it uh, for the county. So that one is, is, is not at the top of the list. There is one at the top of the list, Wine Springs, which has numerous environmental issues 
and which we may or may not be able to satisfy the Forest Service that we can meet those issues. But we're going to try. That kind of stuff takes time. And yes, we've been at it for a long time, and this is the reason it seems like it's taken so long, is this is the second time around. Okay, we, what, what everybody needs to realize is we were told no at Rocky Branch, and we were told no at Wine Springs over a year ago. But we think it's important enough that we're going to go back and ask again, because we've got a little bit different spin to put on at this time. Is it going to change anything? I don't know. I don't know. But rest assured, you're not in this by yourself, okay? Uh, I'm going to battle it just as long as I have a seat up here at this table, which may not be much longer. But, but I'm going to battle it until I no longer have a seat at this table because I think it's important. And because I don't want the people that I see sitting in front of me in the third row doing silly stuff around the dam and other places and me not getting to see you at another meeting. Uh, that bothers me. And, and, and your safety is what got me into this. And your safety is what will make me end it if I ever do end this battle or not get reelected. One of those two things. But we're not anti swimming It was very eloquently, the boat ramp was very eloquently uh, this, as you say, tonight. And it was true. Everything that was said was true. Uh, but the problem we have is, is, remember, we don't control these entities. Fish and wildlife is a state entity. The Forest Service is a federal entity. Food power is an entity unto themselves. And so we don't control those folks, and so there's limits to how fast and how far we can go. And so I appreciate the fact, it, it thrills me as a civics teacher to see people like you and like the people I see a lot uh, here at one of these meetings. And I'm, I'm thrilled to death that you came over to talk to us. I'll try to answer any questions I can, but right now that is where we are. And we've been at this for about 18 months. Uh, if I've got it right. And I've got about another 20. So it ain't over till it's over, as Yogi Berra says. And and, uh, and so we're going to keep on doing battle until, until I run out of time. Uh, God help fish and wildlife if I get rid of it. But because then they're going to deal with it for another four years. But the bottom line is, guys, I appreciate you being here. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Uh, you're not in this alone. Uh, you're not. But it, it is going to take time. We are dealing with some some very, very difficult regulations and some very some regulations that have been around for a long time. And before we get down on those regulations too much, the reason people love Nana Head Lake, Lake as much as they do is because of the sticky regulations that they apply to access to that lake. And so I think we got to remember that, as I always tell my civics classes, this is definitely an issue. The reason it's an issue is because there's two sides. Okay? If there wasn't two sides, it would be a fact, and you can't argue facts. But issues you can argue. This one has two sides. So we we'll welcome you here, and, and I'll be quiet now, and y'all can have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Come on. Don't be shy. We've never, we've never heard anybody up there, haven't you? Uh, okay. Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> While Amber's getting that ready, I just want to say thank you to the Coens for raising the safety issue, because that's key. And as you'll see in her presentation, that. Um, we do know kids are swimming down there at Rocky Branch, and it is an issue. So the point is there needs to be a beach somewhere. And uh, we hope we will find the right place. Johanna, will you get your name? Johanna Heapy. Johanna Heapy. This is, uh, this is Amber, Rear Heart. So we've got Amber on the... <laughs> Amber, go right ahead. Thank you for coming. How come there? This is not like the commercial where the guy gets the dog, but the guy doesn't get to play golf on Sunday. Powerful. Look like a deer. <laughs> 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 right, I watch too much TV. <laughs>
and citation, possibly a hundred dollar fine.
name is Justin Brown. Um, I'm a resident of Nantahewa. So, as you may know, Nantahewa is an amazing place to live. It's quiet and relaxing and has a beautiful lake. Unfortunately, people who live in Nantahewa year-round cannot swim in the lake because there is no safe swimming area. We are limited by the choices we have, and the choices we do have are dangerous in many ways. The places where we can swim are rocky and have deep holes where kids can drown at any time. The marina has offered a swimming spot for kids, but who wants to swim with boats leaking gas right where you're swimming or next to a gas pump that could explode or leak at any time? There have been many complaints by locals and tourists. Concerned locals suggested, why not fix a clean, safe place for kids to swim so they won't be in danger or have to walk along the bank through sharp rocks and high weeds to find a decent spot to swim? This suggestion is reasonable and understandable. Not only because we need a decent spot to swim, Nanahela Lake is part of our community heritage. Our grandfathers and great-grandfathers helped build the dam. Many Nanahela families gave up their property so the lake could exist. People who live year-round in Nanahela are not wealthy and cannot afford lake houses. However, as a community, we have more emotional and family ties to the lake than anyone else. We love our lake, especially in the summer, and we deserve safe swimming access not just because of our love of the lake, but because it is the right thing to do. Most of the lakes in our surrounding area, including Santitla, Chateau, and Hawassi, have safe swimming access, so why shouldn't we? I know that it can be expensive and a lot of hard work, but if we work together and ask for donations, we'll eventually be successful and open up a public beach access area for the children of the Nantahala community. I am a concerned teenager of Nantahala community, and I like all the kids in Nantahala, love our lake, and would appreciate the opportunity to enjoy it as much as others do. Please give our request the utmost consideration.
we're sorry. That was real. Go ahead. <laughs> it really is cool what we're talking about, but, but go ahead. Um, I'm Emily Davis from Manahan School, and I'm a junior this year, and um, I'd like to talk to you about the new church. When tourists come to Manahara, they want to be able to enjoy all the pleasures the Manahara Lake has offered. They want to fish, see waterfalls, cruise around on a boat, and swim. Unfortunately, the only safe place to swim these days is located at Lake Lake, and it's only a small square between the docks. Sure, it's a place to swim, but there isn't enough room for everyone, especially not more than maybe three families. So how do we solve this problem? I'm sure asking for a beach seems a bit extreme, but it's a great idea, and it would provide everyone with a safe place to swim and picnic. We also need to think of the economic gains it could bring to our struggling community. Nanahala Lake would offer a public beach access area where people can picnic and swim. It could potentially bring more people to, to our area as well as provide a place for passing through the forest to stop in the lake and hopefully to see more money in our local businesses, which in turn will have a positive effect on our county um, Lastly, I'm speaking from a personal standpoint when I say that the youth in our area, area deserve a safe place to spend time. The kids in the Nanahala area are both benefited and hurt by our isolation. Due to the lack of public businesses and locations, we suffer from a lack of cohesiveness within our community because many of us have to travel to Franklin, Boston City, or Andrews in order to have places to hang out with our friends. We would like to be able to invite people into the Nanahala area if we actually have something to offer them as a guide. I truly believe that having a beach access point on the Nanahala Lake will give a people a reason for coming and staying in our community. Once again, thank you for your time and consideration for this matter. We appreciate all that you have done and continue to do for your constituents and the Nanahala Lake. Yeah. 
Todd, they tell you, here's your warning. If you come back and put another Todd in the lake, we're charge you 200 bucks. Todd, what did he tell you? Uh, he told us that we knew we shouldn't be swimming there, but I wasn't swimming there, so we could not have been in your thing. I was just wet. <laughs> <laughs> say this is the any other students to speak anybody else does it yeah are there any other students to speak sure yeah. sure before Bobby speaks another step to get a chance to speak again that's right <laughs> so you, I can't explain how impressive that you students are when you quit talking um, <laughs> but you are very impressive and this is what we need to make our you all make it better than you ever made may you give that presentation you made we're very free with the future fire and promises. Been down that road, been there and talked about that. The county manager can attest. And uh, that's not been forgotten. But, uh, and there was an 18% uh, increase in our land. <laughs> <laughs> throw that in. Was, but yeah, it's, uh, was just approved though. So now, does, my understanding, and it's my job to know this, and I didn't understand it either, was that they put that proposal forward way back when, and everybody thought it went through, and then oh, they no. just got their license, and now they're going to go through. That, that, is, that is my understanding, and I was, I was going to try to clarify that for you. All those time frames that you cited are absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. However, yeah. the starting point was not when they made the promise. The starting point was when the license went into effect, which it just did. Just so happened. now, that now I know and I agree with you. Yeah, agree. That sure is mints and words. But that's that's why Duke Power, were they here tonight, would tell you we're still within the confines because we just implemented the new license. So now all those time frames that you cited, which are exactly right, start running at that point in time. Don't seem right to me, but that's but that's that's what they would tell you where they do. Another in the rain discussion that we had down on, but down on the boat docks. So we are familiar with those, and they will be paid attention to that the license. And we need to, I, I'm not going to take up. And Mr. Covers kept asking, you know, what the situation was. You know, they could have pushed it. You know, we know that. Mm -hmm. Right. That, that's all I'm saying. You and I both know that it could have been made a priority, and it wasn't. Okay, it's simple as that. I can't say any simpler than that. But um, what we like to do, and I, I just want to assure you, and I, I love to hear the arguments because – what makes me feel so good about that is I think I have said every single one of those things that you just told me, I have said that to multiple agencies, okay? And I will continue to say it to multiple agencies, and it feels a whole lot better saying it now than I know I'm not saying it by myself. So I want to thank you, and we'd like to recognize you. So if all the students, including the ones in the back row that didn't want to speak, come on up, because if you make the trip all the way across the mountain, we got something we want to give you. So come on up. Uh, and while that's happening, we, there are two things that may have already been said. One, uh, Commissioner Bill mentioned, you guys are a tremendous, uh, uh, put on a tremendous presentation. And also, thank you. And also, uh, every one of us at some time has loved to swim in the lake. I swim in every lake and river where I'm supposed to, where I'm not supposed to, and I still do it sometimes, I'll admit that. But. But the other thing I'd like to say, if you don't already know it, and uh, I try and tell it like it is, there's no bigger advocate that's worked harder than Commissioner Nelson. He has uh, been over backwards. He's spent a lot of time. He's, he's, he's shaking a lot of trees. And, uh, he's really worked hard on your behalf. And uh, 
to. I, I can't imagine anything more that he could try to do, and he's continuing to do that. So I just want to let you know he's been carrying the water for you guys. Thanks. And uh, we believe there's a, a good uh, compromise where there can be safety. The boat is going to have a problem and there's a place to swim. So uh, I just want to say thank you for this recovery. This is why. This is why we do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
to single home dwelling, which would make it more appropriately into your ordinance, unless we're prohibited from doing that by the state. And that's what we would fall back on you for, is to tell us, no, you can't do that. Okay, we'd so have to make a decision where to go from there. But so what I hear you saying is you would like for us to to examine these are the these are this is the bullet list of the yes. Okay, okay. So you want yeah, to have but, but but look Barry and, and let me let me say this if I might. <coughs> that's what what you're looking at is what was brought before us mm -hmm. from the planning board, uh basically the, the state flood committee. That's what they came up with. We're in the process and we've had one very preliminary I'll call it meeting. Uh, we're going to have to have several work sessions to determine what we think is appropriate for the county. So, <clears throat> what uh, Commissioner Bill gave you is what was presented to us, but mm -hmm. we've got a lot of work to do, I believe, sure. uh, before we know what to present to you, and then we'll have to figure out how do we incorporate that, whether there's S and A or subdivision or whatever. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, and, we and, and I think sure. it might be helpful Mr. Chairman, if we might, if you've got that list to take a look at and if there's something that you can look off of that list and say, this can't go in here, that would be mm -hmm. useful data for us. I mean, I don't think you have to gather the yeah, right, right. watership right. commission right. to go right. do right. that, exactly. but just by law, you right. can't put that in here. Right. That would be nice well, for we'll, us to know. That's okay. good data for us to have as we move down the path. Okay, that'll be our first cut. Get that. Right. Get that back to you. You decide what you want include, uh, you want us to incorporate. As, as you're doing that, we'll be massaging them, and I think it would be behoovous if we come to an agreement on one or two of them and not the rest that we can't yeah. follow on those. Yeah. If, you want, if you want to work as quickly as you can. You just want to think Derek, yeah, Derek, yeah, sure. yeah, that, I think that'll work good. It might save a little time, and mm -hmm. we won't over it. Or back it up, we won't over it. Back it up, we won't over it. Sounds good. That sounds like a good plan. We're, we're agreeing on that. And I believe, and I think it's the, the belief of the, the council that that this is a this is an improved ordinance. I mean, the, the, the revisions that we made two years ago are still I mean, to bring it up to date to, to state standards change all the time. Bring up states, but the state standards still would be compliant. But also in general, I think it's going to be fair. It's going to be it's very sensible and, uh, and and effective. So it's good work. I think. It's good work. I'll just testify that right now. It's good. And the only other thing I wanted to mention, and I just reiterate what Jenny brought up earlier, so about the time limits, and, I, and we as a board. Council feel like that time limits are probably appropriate for some of the appointed boards and councils and panels here in Macon County. Um, I think it deserves that each board and council and panel needs to be uh, examined independently to determine what their objectives are and what expertise might need to be in place. As far as the council goes, the watershed council goes, we've got uh, a wealth of, um, of, uh, of experience and expertise, uh, that institutional experience and expertise that exists on the council right now that she um, she's been able to draw on and, and I think if term limits were to be imposed just sort of across the board and I'm sure that's not what the plan doing or thinking about but that would in effect um, render the council at least less effective and maybe maybe ineffective. I don't know. Depends on who can come in to replace those who have this experience with drawing on count uh, ordinances and that sort of thing. So it's our belief that that you please consider this deliberately, where you intend to apply it, that you consider each individual panel or council independently based on their charters, if they have one like we do, you can go about that very deliberately. And I think that's all I've got, unless anybody has any more questions. Bill? Very thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. All right, guys. <coughs> Moving on to our uh, old business uh, item nine A, the exchange of real estate homes. That's the official uh, property with the piece that's not contiguous to the other piece that is. Uh, just, uh, just real brief background. Uh, those uh, one, and I'm not sure which is which, Mr. Manager. You can tell me, but one's uh, tax appraised value is one sixty seven, the other one one sixty five. I believe so. So they're essentially, yes, and, and what, um, I'm not sure if the, the you guys, the last two that we're going to go up and look, you've done that, but uh, what uh, I, I thought with uh, Commissioner Bill, also with Commissioner Cuppers about this, and, and, we, and, and we thought that it might be worthwhile to talk to the uh, people that use the property, which is the Recreation Department, and uh, what what they felt might be in the best interest of the county, and contacted uh, Mr. Jeff Weller and he took it the next, it just so happened the next night that the county recreation was having their monthly meeting and he took it to them and, and basically what came back to us, correct me if I'm wrong anyone, is they felt that on an immediate basis it would be more beneficial to have a piece of property that's contiguous to the two pieces uh, or contiguous on two
two sides to what we currently have because we don't know in current economic times. So they're just to clarify, they're they're for the exchange. They're just saying there's nothing they what, what they said was we'd like to see the exchange made because there's nothing we can do with this other piece of property. We'd rather be able to use the a half to a, a third to a half of the piece of property that the we're trading for, for rather than hoping that someday we can be contiguous with the others. I, I understand their position as a recreation board. I told them I would relay that with Brian already at the board. Uh, and that's what, that's what they said. I understand that. Okay. I'm not saying I agree with it, but I do understand what you're saying. So, so I mean, that's, that's kind of where we're at. And uh, the other reason we're bringing this up, and Mr. Manager, you can give us some additional information, but also because this is an exchange, the, the piece of property will have to be advertised and, and uh, because if anybody wants to do something akin to, if not actually an upset bid, that process has to be allowed. It, it, it does, it has to be. Actually, this was on the agenda two previous times and before that we had to advertise probably 10 days maybe. Well, this one would not entail upset bids if it's a, a genuine exchange, but there is a requirement chunk of property being developable and a third to a quarter, a third to a half of a piece of property being developable. And while I understand the rec from the rec committee's perspective, I absolutely agree. This one over here is nothing to them, but it is something to the county. And and I don't see trading one piece of property, which I, I understand what the tax values are, but I also been out there and walked the topography and I just don't think that you're trading even and so for that reason, and I'm not trying to be difficult, I, I, I'm, I'm just, I know I'm stubborn, but I, my mind has not changed. I, I fully believe that we're not trading even, we're trading for expediency, and that's fine. We're helping the rec department, and that's fine. 
but I want to trade even, and I don't think we are, and so I'll vote against it, but I think I'll lose, but that's okay. I've lost before. As long as I don't lose on Friday night, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want you to lose me. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, comments? But I think, you know, we have to look at reality, and I, I, I don't disagree with Bobby on that, but the reality is, what's going to be a subject county in the next 10 years? Let's just look at it briefly. And this, this piece of property, as far as the topography of the property, Bobby's right. But what's going to best serve the county in the next 10 years, as far as we can see it right now? And so with that in mind, uh, I, determined I, would, I would support the exchange of the property. Just simply because you've talked to people who use the property. And with the new soccer field in Highlands, I don't ever see this expanded. No. I don't ever see it expanded in there, and I don't see the county outlaying there's hundreds of thousands of dollars it's going to take to get access to those other lots. So some folks, some folks up there really disagree on the exchange part, but you have to, as a commissioner, I think it's my duty to look what's going to benefit the county most in the next foreseeable future. The foreseeable future for us, with where we're at now, is that piece of property. And there are things you can do, but there's even things you can do on the lower level of that property. I have some different ideas than, you know, and Bobby's right, the topography's not the same. But what's going to benefit this, I think, benefit the recreation highlands the most in the foreseeable future. I don't see that rec park expanding by leaps and bounds. So with that determined, I, I, would, I would also support the exchange property. You, you asked uh, you asked the recreation group of well, The whole county recreation. The whole county recreation. Right. And they gave you an answer that that property gets it. Because they don't see that the other piece is not contiguous, there's a, a no value to them at the current time. Right. Let me just unless, you had, out. unless you had other properties that adjoined it or made that well, property. And if, we, and if we knew that going forward we were going to expand this by another, and by, by half, yeah. but with the new soccer field in Highland, mm -hmm. that changed the whole perspective yeah. of, of, of the current right. on short off. Right. Right. And, let, and let me just explain on what Commissioner uh, Bill said. When that when, when that piece of property was purchased, the other soccer field had not been built, and and our revenues were much different than they are today. We were in kind of an expansion. Well, there was some there was some called the buying some additional properties. That was the original intent. Go with when, that, right? when, when that when when that county board. That voted to buy that piece of property. The intent was that they would buy all the other pieces in between to expand to right. a, a, a pretty big expansion, which would have been mm -hmm. a glorious thing if we could have done it, but the economy kind of changed all that. But so I think there, there's there. some feeling out there that <coughs> if we vote to do this change, that we are uh, sort of questioning the validity of that purchase. Is that fair? I, I don't see it that way. No, I well, see I mean, I'm saying there's, there's yeah. different time. No, no, no it's, what, different, I, I, I it's different time, and, and they had they had exactly. But, but no, here's here's my point, point. And, and, I, and I'll just I don't want to argue because I'm going to lose it. I can count the four. <laughs> but, I, but dad gummit, let's don't put words in my mouth. I do not believe that we are ever going to expand or buy the property in between there and the red part. I say. You've got a pretty valuable piece of property that is developable, and yes, the thing is depressed right now, but if you go out 10, year, 10 years, you might be able to get a decent price for that property. And I think the money that could be obtained from selling that property might be better than the 10 parking places that it's going to add to a parking lot which is never full. I don't think that I've ever said, not a single time, have I said we're going to expand out and make that piece of property usable. I said you're not trading even, and you're not. You're, you're, adding, you're adding 15 parking places to a parking lot that's never going to be full. And so you're not going to add fields. You're not going to create a basketball court. You're going to, you're going to build, expand the parking lot. That's what you're going to do. Well, and so we my point is, well, that's true. If, you, if you're into that, I'll tell you what, go for it. But I'm just saying, more years, right? I'm just saying that, 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 is, that, that is a county asset that is worth a certain amount of money. And that is what I think is a county asset that is worth a certain amount of money. <laughs> okay, and, and in 10 years, who knows what that county asset is going to be worth compared to what it is today. So if I'm asking what's in the best interest of the county over the next 10 years, I, I don't see the imperative to make the swap. I don't see the plans for that rec park or that parking lot that make it essential to make the swap now, and that's why, and also.
Well, I mean, the, the point well taken. I just, uh, uh, I guess I trust our tax assessor when he says they're legal value, I'll, I'll, and that's what the tax base says, I'll take it to that. We do have a motion to swap that piece of property. Uh, do we have a second? I, I, don't a think we can, I don't think we can actually take that action tonight. I think what the most we can do tonight is do Advertise the intent of the board. Is that way when you advertise the intent? Advertise the intent. Not bound to do it, but right. uh, we're, we're, we're going to okay, we'll bring it up for yeah. discussion. But. Well, we you made your motion to say, we're, we're, what are we doing? We're taking a, a uh, just I think, I think we've got, got the consensus. They, they come out make a motion. We authorize the county manager and county attorney to advertise. To determine that uh, that we that we uh, our desire to proceed with land transaction. Is that is that all we need? Do we, I, need I we don't need to take a vote on that, or, or do we have to? Do you see that? Is that what you want? I mean, do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. I, think we have, I, think, I don't think we need to vote. Well, no, there is no vote. We'll just yeah. advertise and we'll vote after we do that. All right, thank you. All right, we'll move on, gentlemen. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, item 9B. Uh, telecommunications facilities, Black Tower from North Carolina Highway Patrol, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you all recall, we've been going around and around to try to get this 800 megahertz Black Tower installed uh, in North Carolina uh, to the Highway Patrol uh, down property that's owned by the county uh, off of uh, uh, Addison Bridge Road, I believe it is. Uh, during the process, we did talk to uh, uh, Marty Randall. question came up, a couple questions came up. One is, uh, what about fall zone? Because, you know, we don't know whether the tower may or may not fall at some point in time. So he had his, and once you have in your agenda packet this information, we got back from him saying that uh, the, the, the maximum fall zone area on this tower would be 100 feet because it's designed specifically to fold in on itself and fall back. Chances of falling are extremely remote, by the way. If I could tell you how deep the concrete is on this thing and how much it would look good to have a sizable hurricane to even top of that thing over. But that was one question. The other one is um, uh, our ordinance basically uh, controls the communications towers. It was designed and written in a way to address primarily cellular telephone towers. And that's what we have an ordinance for. And we've always used it to enforce the ordinance restrictions on cellular telephone towers. But this is also a communications tower. We won't have any cellular, private cellular service on it because it's not allowed. But there is some confusion as to what our ordinance says and what we can and can't do. Some counties have taken to the point of asking the state attorney general's office to give us a, a recommendation on what supersedes. And the attorney general's office has been consistent to say that the state uh, rules, regulations of the FCC supersedes any kind of ordinance that we might have locally. And for some people, that's good. Other counties have taken taken the uh, tact of going back, amending their current uh, communications tower ordinance to speci specifically state that uh, these towers of this type that are not used for commercial telephone services and, 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 and local uh, uh, are, uh, are allowable even though they may not fit in the categories of our regular commercial um, towers. The county attorney has done some research on this and has some recommendations. Uh, we think probably if the board is willing to do this, it's probably a good time to go ahead and clarify our ordinance to make sure that people understand these emergency communications towers are not um, commercial cellular telephone towers, and they don't follow the same rules and regulations as our local ordinance does but those are superseded by the state and federal government. We could go ahead and clarify that. To do that, the board would have to have a public hearing to amend that ordinance before you actually finalize the lease uh, with the state for use of that property. I think he's done a very good job stating that the ordinance, uh, I think, really originally was designed to deal primarily with commercial towers. However, the definition communications however is much broader than just purely for cellular telephone activity. It's a very broad definition and it could be construed to include 
approve this to the extent that it uh, was approvable under state North Carolina law. Uh, the county manager is correct also that in some situations that are very similar to this particular situation, uh, there is a, there's a, an attorney general's opinion which by analogy would seem to apply to this situation uh, and suggest that a county is without authority to regulate the placement of the communication power by the state of North Carolina because they have no specific grant authority to do so. Uh, so that's an opinion of the Attorney General. There's also a letter that contains a similar uh, opinion, but it's not doesn't have the same weight as an official Attorney General uh, on a very similar matter. Uh, again, not directly uh, identical to this, but sufficiently analogous to where the uh, State Highway Patrol certainly uh, believes that uh, the county is without authority in this particular case to regulate the state placement and construction of towers by the state. One thing that is clear, though, is the way the uh, ordinance is written right now, the county is subject to that ordinance. And quite frankly, the county may have needs with technology increases and otherwise to be able to, to con uh, construct whatever towers they may need for the health, safety, and welfare of citizens of Macon County. And quite frankly, I think the county should have that ability to do so in other words, we don't have no choice. And there are no cases or no statutes that say that the Attorney General is correct on this point. Uh, I think it's a fairly solid opinion. Uh, safe Harbor, though, from this board, is to amend it. So, and I would be inclined to It's a fairly easy process to do that. We bring clarification to, to that point. Move forward for not only uh, stay more, to be clear on the point for the state of North Carolina, but should the need rise in the future for the county to have a tower of its own, and uh, yeah, we'll be able to move forward. Mr. Chairman, in light of that, I'd like to make a motion to authorize the county manager and county attorney to amend our ordinance concerning sale tires and communication tires to come into compliance with the state of North Carolina and bring it back to this board and we'll set a vote to Second. We've got a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, sir. <coughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, yeah. Uh, with with uh, <coughs> chairman's discretion and agreement from the other board members, if we could. If we could move item 10B up, we've got Mr. Jerry Sutton here, and he wants to speak about an abandoned graveyard. He's been sitting here all night. Now, these other guys get paid most of them, so some of you don't. <laughs> but, board but, paper together? But this, this will be pretty quick. <coughs> so if y'all would please uh, indulge. Go ahead, Mr. Sutton. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to come on behalf of the Abandoned Graveyard Association. Uh, we have been working with the Abandoned Graveyard Association. Uh, I, I respect the uh, recognition you've given the people tonight and the students as folks. Uh, I'm going to represent a group of people you won't ever hear from again because they're all in the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> what, what I'm talking to you about, and you had a letter, and I should have your back. Uh, this cemetery is it's a time that something has to be done. Whether we do it or somebody else does it, or where nothing's ever done, and it grows up into a local what's in right now, those are spread. And what we'd like to do, and we're, as I say, we're promoting the reclaiming of the cemetery. It has a fence around it. It's in the middle of a pasture. It was, the fence was fixed about 10 years ago. It's covered about an acre of ground. It's got people buried there who uh, some of us know, and people that I work with, other folks, in fact, a long time ago. Ron Haven knows some of them. Uh, there and some of you know some of them, but our uh, Colonel, a uh, Captain Thomas Angel, who was a captain in the Civil War, was the first uh, family that was buried there. His family was buried there, and they're a white family, they're buried all in one row 
on one end of the cemetery, and then they turned it over to the, as they didn't turn it over, it just became used as a slave cemetery and as colored folks. And many folks in Franklin, the colored people, are buried there. And it's used about as much as any colored cemetery in the country. The last person buried there was, a, was buried there last year in 2010. And I don't suspect many more people. But the problem with the cemetery, and then I'll, I'll cease to talk, is that there's no relatives left to take care of the cemetery. There's nobody left to take care of it. And our community club has agreed uh, as much as we can to promote the uh, reclaiming of the cemetery, fence it, and then we're we're gonna we want to get in there and do some work. And we've got already voted as a club to do that. Get in there and fill the graves back up. The thing you need to do if you want to appreciate the thing is to drive up there and go up Long Road and turn to the left and go out on top of the hill and see where it is. And some of you have been there probably. But it's it's just an abandoned cemetery that needs some uh, loving work. And like I said in the beginning. If we don't do it now, uh, I don't know who's going to do it. Again. And we've accepted the responsibility, and uh, you have seen our request in here. And I know that money is a, not a very nice subject. And I hope that there's some avenue, maybe you can get some help from the state. I don't know about you. But that, that's kind of our request. If you can help us, uh, we'll, we'll promote it. We'll do all we can do. But we, we have to have some help. Mr. Chairman, I would remind this board that under the statutes that uh, this board is responsible for that in cemetery in, in some form of public. And uh, so this, and this is this is public. Well, that, that's the one question I wanted to try to uh, flesh out a little bit. We can do it another time or do it here either way. But we, we are going to need a little bit more history in order to determine. To, to determine and, uh, and does that statute, does it say County commissioners to provide public and abandoned or public. I, I think the intent is abandoned and public. Right. Now, there's also some requirements for dealing with public cemeteries as well. There's a requirement that you uh, that you specifically uh, keep a list of those things and supposed to be kept in special deeds. Well, Mr. Chairman, in light of that, regardless of what what it is or not. $3,781 to preserve this American history. I think the most that we appropriate the money if, uh, if the Park Chapel or something is going to the Park Chapel uh, Community Club is willing to take over this project and for that amount of money uh, I think the county would be well served in preserving this history <coughs> and assisting this community. I agree. Second. Second. That, that would be uh, we turn that money over to them. They would manage that money. We, we had rather so we designate that money. Yeah, I got two quick questions. Number one, uh, first of Mr. Terry, are, are we on solid ground there, legal ground? <coughs> I think I think you likely are. Uh, the, the little bit of history that I have here suggests to me that this may not be a legally owned public cemetery, but it certainly appears to be a de facto public cemetery. But the statute says to encourage the persons in possession or control of the public cemeteries referred to in the statutes and so forth to take care of and beautify such cemeteries and distinctly mark the boundary lines so on and so forth. I think that's what we're asking. My, my only thing would just be, I mean, if, if, if anybody doesn't have a problem with it, uh, I wouldn't mind having our attorney just research it just to make sure we're not setting a precedent that it, is, that it does fall within that statute. I, mean, I really, I, Mr. Chairman, I really don't. If, if it says in our word, we're asking to assist the community. I mean, we can go back to statute, you can read, we can have all the lawyers speak all night you know, for different circumstances. What we're doing is assisting the community, uh, no, no different than we just assisted the for a building. This is to assist the community and and to help with the history of this county more than it is any other statute or whatever. But I think it is our responsibility. I think the statute is pretty clear. When it comes to a public cemetery, when you have what distinguishes that is that can anybody be buried there? As far as I know, there's no restrictions. 
Well, they have been with people as, as, as opposed to a non vote which would be like a family. That's exactly yeah, a family. Like a, a, family. a reserve family. Or a commercial private. Yeah. Well, it just, if you look at the names back here, uh, on the back there, there's a whole family there. They have carpenters. And uh, Ron knows George Carpenter that lived out there on Green Street and Andrew Angel. And they're buried there because they had nowhere else to be buried. The, the statute that you're reading from as well also has some limitations on what you can spend and how you can spend it as well. So just be cautious that whatever you do is is in uh, accordance with the statute. Well, I'm looking to you to tell me if it does or does. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's probably, let's do it's it. probably what I'm telling you is I don't have the information to advise you. This I think it's probably that it says to take proper care of and to beautify such cemeteries, and then it names some specific things distinctly marked boundary lines, their green hedges, grow some trees, so and so forth, but that properly take care of and beautify. Now, if, if it's not within the statute, Mr. Chairman, it don't change my emotion because I think we're assisting the community here in preserving the peace of the Lake County. The distinguishing feature uh, between the cemetery and community center is the community center will be returning uh, something to the, to the public uh, by doing that. Now I hear your argument that there may be some historical significance here. Well there's no doubt you've got let's a captain look, in the yeah, let's have a war. Let me ask you this Mr. Attorney. Is it within, is it within the, the purview of, of the county to even, even if it weren't a public <coughs> cemetery, there's no question about that. Is it still within our purview to do that? Uh, that doesn't make us somehow obligated for anybody to ask for that. It's kind of like Mr. Bill said, depending on who you ask, which attorney you ask, you can get different answers to that question. Call the question, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I, I do have one last question I want to ask. I'm not a little Mr. Sutton, this is just a curiosity question more than anything else. <clears throat> and, and, and I think we'll probably all agree we'd like to do this. My only question is a legal one. But if we did this, then who who will maintain it after that point? Okay. Yeah, that's what I was going to We are we adopted this as a club property. I'm 75 years old. And I'm the club <laughs> president right now. <laughs> I hope that the, the fact that we're adopted it as a club. 20 years from now, the Park Chapel Community Club, and that's our intent, that the Park Chapel Community Club is still going to be directly responsible for this center. Okay, thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm very sensitive to it. I, uh, one of the memories I have as a small child, I mean, very small, probably six years old, my grandparents had a grave. It was actually a church cemetery, but it had grown up literally chest high in briars and brambles. And uh, I remember my dad going out there, he was probably about 24 or 5 at the time. And we sat out there, and I can't remember how hot it must have been, but we sat there and watched him with a sling blade for 16 hours, you know, knocking everything down and getting it back. And it's still today in good shape. But once he got it done, you know, the church came back forward and took it over. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, very... Uh, Empathetic to what you're trying to do, and, and so I mean, I don't. As, as long as, uh, if I could just ask this one thing, I don't mind going ahead and voting on. I'll vote for it. But Chester, is it okay to ask them just to research this? I hate to say for the heck of it, because we're going to go ahead and do what we're going to do. But, but could could you? Uh, is, do y'all have a problem with asking them to do that? I, I think the only only thing in that, or is it there's no use? Came out here <coughs> probably that may not meet the eye. Generally speaking, this is not just. We're assisting the community. You're assisting the community. The community club has, has agreed to if you can preserve this, they will maintain it. I mean, that's what you're saying in your And I, let me tell you that the lady who owns the land now is Ms. Gladys Jennings. The J. Jennings family owns it. We have we already got permission from her and she drove and signed the agreement that uh, it's okay with her but we don't know where there's a deed to this cemetery, other than we know that it was deeded out of the Jennings property. 
any traffic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on the tax books on it as its own piece of property, not owned by anybody except the people who live there on that property. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
So, so would it be fair to say that we, well, obviously I think what you're telling us uh, is, is that you need a little more time to, to uh, do a little bit more research on that. And could we expect that uh, at our, our regularly scheduled meeting in December you'd have that information? Yeah, I, I want to get clarification of the boards because Jack and I had different, different notes. I had six different boards on my list. And I think when we spoke with you briefly, you were thinking there were just three on that list. And so I do want to get clarification. I think that, the, and I'm prepared to discuss uh, probably the ones that are, are most interesting this evening if you I, want to discuss them. So. I, I, I would say let's just do it all one time. What do you guys yeah. well, not Not now, but we'll <coughs> let, you, let you, you two gentlemen finish your discussion. And, uh, and do Jack, it one time. I know he sent that to you. I met with him about another issue. He sent that to me this afternoon. I've not had a chance to read that. Well, I think there's some merits. He found the bylaws for these. A lot of these boards have bylaws. Have you had a chance to read all those bylaws? We have not looked at the bylaws for all of the boards. We focused on six boards. Is what we did. Yeah, I think most of us have bylaws. They, they, well, I'm sure they probably. Now you've got an you ordinance or a statute thing. establishing the separate. The other thing, thing that we don't have that I know of. Two are not on the list. 
and that, I guess it would be my point. <coughs> they're on that list, Ronnie, but they're not on the list of the ones we're looking to employ to, to put term limits on. But, but so they're safe. We're not going to change what we're doing with those boards. Why are they safe? Well, because we're not looking at them to put term limits on. Okay. We're, we're looking at the five or six that he's looking at. That's all I'm saying. Because I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying about being careful. But I've but made some mistakes several times. You know, people on these boards need to be knowledge to know what's going on. No, but, but Ronnie, if, if, if you if you desire to uh, that every, all 51 boards be looked at, they can do that. But what we did last time was we said, what are the boards that we want? Process. So we but I think I've been consistent saying that this the county commissioner is the term limit board. You have the term limit, so this board of county commissioner. What, uh, I said I don't disagree with that. I, I made that comment the last time. I said you know there's, there's two I mean, ways. You only you, you, way you, you can screen on the front end, or you can screen yeah, on the way out. It's, it's, it, that, that's it's, that's your choice. It's political. It's it political will. It's what it boils down to. It's political will, but. But my only question was, if we're going to go with the six, didn't we say EDC rather than TDC? I think both, actually. Okay. Well, I, just, I didn't hear EDC. Yes, I, 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 I remember your decision and, and, the, and the vice decision of what board you want to look at. I don't think my position is going to change a little bit. I'm not sure mine is either. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what I was going to Okay, so, so are we agreed then the boards that we talked about last time, those are the ones we want to look at? Have, have you guys been to? I think that's fine. Without the additional rules. All right, so we'll just look for you guys to, to uh, give us the rest of the information for our December. Okay, moving on. Uh, new business. Uh, first, uh, now the adult dental services. Uh, Mr. Brockman. And, and, and if I can't preface what you're getting ready to say by just saying that, that uh, we did have a uh, earlier meeting that. Uh, Vice Chairman Cuffers and myself uh, sat down with several members of the health board and uh, kind of began the process of uh, looking at the uh, adult dental services. Uh, just as a real, real brief background, when that was originally set up, that was a basically a, I don't want to the wrong terminology, an enterprise fund. The self funding is, was the idea uh, that, you know, that's how it was set up at that time, and some things have changed pretty drastically as we know going forward and so uh, even though the health board has it within their uh, authority to decide what to do with this program because it does uh, currently involve a good bit of county dollars in the future potentially can involve a whole lot more they wanted our input before they decided what to do if that's fair to say having said that I'll turn it over to you. Yeah um, I'm going to be real quick you've got about 18 slides there that I sent out the other day. I'm only going to cover about four of them. Most of them were informational uh, and related to the four that I'm going to cover or five that I'm going to cover. But the first one, as Christian McCormick was saying, uh, the Board of Health appointed the Hoc Committee of the Board uh, with several members of uh, the Board of Health who are present here and uh, two commissioners, uh, Commissioner Cuppers and Commissioner McClellan, and uh, some key staff from the Health Department. There were two issues that we were looking well, one primary issue we're looking at is the uh, sustainment of adult dental services. But we're looking at it from two different perspectives. Um, we've been in without a dentist for a while now, and, uh, and we've been holding it together, as one of the board members said, with bubble gum and paper clips uh, for about the past seven months uh, since our uh, full-time dentist left. Uh, we've had, uh, I think we have five contract dentists now, um, some working one day a month, some working one day every other month, some working two days a week. Uh, and it is very piecemeal. We've got clients who are leaving uh, because of the uh, inconsistencies in treatment, uh, and uh, dentists, not treatment necessarily, but in the inconsistencies in the dentist that's there. Um, they uh, pretty much uh, were supportive of the recommendations uh, by the staff. Uh, they were less supportive of option one, uh, which was the mothballer program, I'll go into that in a minute, and more supportive of uh, option two, and they, uh, that group, that ad hoc committee asked me to come represent the Board of Health today uh, to present to you the three options. Option one, or the three requests rather that we have. Um, the first one is funding uh, the program uh, now uh, and maybe in the future. And in the future, I'll get into talking about that in a second. The second one was the proposed recruiting or retention options, um, since we are having such a difficult time recruiting <coughs> at this point. And the last one is a proposed sliding fee scale, and this is twofold. One is it's a piece of the recruitment attention issue, 
And the second one is that it's an issue for clients as we've raised the fees in the dental program, um, accessing services and what they're having to pay for the service now. And I'll talk about that real quick. Now, a little bit of history. Uh, the dental program was started with the Cape Reynolds grant for $100,000. There was no initial county money in it. Um, we uh, average about $45,000 a year in additional revenue uh, back to the county uh, through the adult dental program. Started out as about $13,000 the first year in operation uh, and uh, has grown since then. Last year was uh, the lowest in two years, uh, but it averages about $45,000. Um, we see about 3,200 Maine County residents. Uh, there were 9,225 law students since 2007 when the program was open, and we've done a little over 20,000 procedures. The two primary objectives that we have that we want to yeah, discuss. Before you get into that, is that for that time, 07 to 11? 07 to 11, since the program has been That's all those business work between that two and a half years. And those are single camps? Those are the 3,200 is single camps. Single camps. 3,200 individuals. That's only the period of seven. Visits. You count 2007? Um, it started in July of 2007 and uh, yeah, they got so nine out of ten. Three years. 2011. That's counting multiple visits by those county residents. 3,200 people, 9,225 visits by those 3,200 people, and those 3,200 people received 20,000 procedures in that in four year period. Um, short term option one, uh, what we need, uh, or option one was mothball program. That was the one that, that was least palatable to the to the uh, ad hoc committee. Uh, there was no additional cost to the county, but no one would get any services as we mothball the program if we find a dentist. We let the staff go, then we'd have to try and, once we had a dentist, we'd be back in the same situation we were the first time when we started the clinic. We went six months without staff because you've got to find staff and hire staff and get to train and get in. Uh, so that was not the best case scenario. The second one, option two, was the one that was more palatable uh, to the group, and that's the one that they would like your opinion on uh, tonight, and that was to increase uh, funding for the adult dental program for the near term this year. Um, right now we're looking at a shortfall somewhere, best case scenario, between $53,000 and worst case scenario, $105,000. And you know, uh, just to clarify, you said the thing that basically been profitable. It's been, been profitable up until this year. So if you're talking about a, a additional funding need, is that because you don't physically have a dentist on staff and therefore most of your income? Because we're piece melding right now and and when you piece meld with dentists, they don't see near the number of clients and if we're not seeing near the number of clients, we're not generating that revenue. Okay. And that's our problem. We've got dentists who want to come one day, so it's but it's an eight hour day instead of a ten hour doing day. Doing what you're doing now. This is to hire either a local tenant's dentist full time through a company contract until we can recruit a dentist and hire somebody because we have been recruited. Uh, and uh, or continue doing what we're doing now. If we continue what we're doing now, the shortfall grows. Um, and I can and there is a slide in there that, that talks about that shortfall and why uh, base case scenario and worst case scenario. Best case scenario is that we hire a local tenant's dentist, full time contract dentist wow. increases. Uh, local they call them a locum tenants. Locum tenants. It's a, a contract provider. They do that with physicians, dentists, nurses, um, and they, they basically come in and work for a period of time. But it is also true that the reason you see these full page ads in the Franklin Press for dentists in office, it's all dentists are recruiting patients in Macon County. Correct. There's no dentist in Macon County that's not accepting patients. They're recruiting patients, and they have dropped their prices mm -hmm. to recruit those. So that's another thing is the competition. But then when this first starting, the, the, it was so much cheaper than going to a regular dentist. That's not the case. Right. So we're in competition with the really local dentist. That, the prices are almost, we had some people that went to the thing, and they went up 100%, and they came to me. And I think they had priced some, some dentists in town. So, so it's, so it's competitive only, with the yeah, local dentist. There's only one dentist in town taking on new Medicaid patients. Um, and right now there's a few that are taking some fee for service, um, but it's you pay up front before you get these, before you get the service. Uh, and one of the things I'm gonna talk about in a minute is, our, is what we intend to try and uh, get approval for around a sliding fee scale. But best case scenario, $53,000. That's because the contract <coughs> dentist is gonna cost us more than a, a, a full-time employed dentist um, during that period of time. And it's also to offset some of the, the loss in revenue that we have. The $105,000 is, um, if we continue band-aiding it like we've been doing uh, for the rest of this year, 
Uh, we continue generating the amount of revenue that we've been generating the past three months, and our shortfall is just going to continue to grow. Um, so that's number one that we need to uh, have approval for tonight. Uh, long term, this is just informational because this is going to take part or place during the budget process. Um, long term, there's two things that you need to be aware of. There's one is that the Medicaid cost settlement that we currently get from the state um, for dental services is going to go away in about a year, uh, and that is about $54,900. Um, the second thing on that option one is, is that if, if you approve the recommendations that we have um, for salary for the dentist, that is going to increase our dental, co dental program cost by about $21,000. But again, if we have a full-time dentist, we can probably make up that $21,000. But the 54 is going to be a big hole uh, in coming years. The second thing is beyond 2013, uh, as we all know, there's a lot of issues around Medicaid. There are 100 and I think it was $148 million <coughs> in the hole uh, the other day, the last number I heard about a week and a half ago. Um, one of the things they're looking at is optional <coughs> services, and adult dental is an optional service. And then hygienists can keep working right over. No, hygienists can't work right over. Yeah, I mean, yeah, what do they do when the dentist like that? We're doing other things to do with them. That's all we can do. We're trying to hold on to them until we make decisions today as to what we're going to do with the dental program. Jim, under a normal full-time dentist, what would the hygienist be doing? Full-time hygienist. Yeah. Eight, ten hours a day. And they generate revenue with a lot. That's the dentist. You have those employees if, if, if we had a full-time dentist. Yes, we have. She used to be assistant full-time. Well, no, not. Right now, she's seen, when we have no, a dentist, would, she's seen would, it. Would, would be. If you had a full time dentist, she would be fully be doing full time, full time hygiene. Yes. But you, you have to have a dentist. You have to have a dentist in, under, yeah. under the roof. Under the law. Hygiene is because they find a cavity, find something else. Hey, the dentist has to work. Correct. We do have kind of a special dispensation for our hygienists because we're public health and they're, they've got a special certification in the public health dental hygienist. But as long as we have a dentist who's on staff, who's created a care plan for that patient. The hygienist can act on the things that the hygienist can act on in that care plan if the dentist, the dentist isn't physically present. The problem is we've already worked through that. That, that We don't we have that. we cleared that whole backlog. We've cleared that whole backlog and it's not there. Right now we have piecemeal dentists and uh, if you have piecemeal dentists, you can't do that. We have to have a full-time dentist. Do you so think you'd be have a better dentist if you had better working conditions for that dentist? think you could recruit dentists better if you had better working conditions? Better office. A better office, better space? Oh, we definitely could. Yeah, better office, better space, more. How much you paying now? How you paying for at least seven hundred fifty dollars a month? Right now, um, we are going to add. As I go through here, with one of the things on that long term is, is that that you have on your slide there. Right? If I didn't already change it on yours too, um, is is that we are going to have to look for space later on down the road, um, and it probably will cost us more money. However, a dentist with one chair. Can only be so productive. A dentist with two chairs can be a whole lot more productive. My example for somebody the other day was I went to the dentist about a week and a half ago and got a fill in the first one in a long time. And uh, I was in the chair, my wife was in the chair in the room next to me getting filling, and there was a guy in the room on the other side of me getting something else. Yeah, he ain't was going ding ding ding. No, 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 not the county insurance. Um, but uh, the uh, the point is, is here, this guy in the same 45 minutes saw three patients that our dentist can see one because of the chair situation we're at. And that is something that needs to be corrected. That's something that's been No there. way you can put this in half part. No, no, we don't. They, they built three rooms. Um, we have three chairs now. We need probably seven chairs in order for that to be a truly effective plan, in order for that dentist to be fully productive. And we're just getting by. And if we move into the health form, we'd have three chairs. We don't have the space in the health form. Those are occupied spaces now. I'd have to find something, someplace for those folks to go. In the original plans for the building, they were earmarked as dental plumbing, dental chip, dental rooms. Is he plumbing? But they never, no. They're not. Are plumbing for that? Mm -hmm. We'd have to tap into whatever's in the ceiling. There's no compressors in, there's no air lines in, there's no suction lines in, all of that stuff would have to be installed. Moving on. Second, that's the first thing, is the $53,000 that we're looking at in shortfall for sure this year that we're, we're estimating. The second thing that we need to uh, have a conversation on involves recruiting of the dentist. And, uh, the county manager and I have had uh, several conversations about dental recruiting, and uh, we, we kind of did our own little bit of a salary survey 
uh, and got some information. The first thing we need to do is we currently aren't eligible for loan forgiveness through either the state program or the federal program um, because we don't have a sliding fee scale in place. That's one reason why we want to try and pursue a sliding fee scale. The second reason I'll tell you about when I get to the about two, one or two more slides now. Um, but we need to implement a sliding fee scale. If we do that, it is not a guarantee that that dentist is going to get loan forgiveness. They have to apply. We don't apply as a county. The individual <coughs> dentist applies on their own, and, uh, and that is limited funding. The second piece is the salary recommendation for the dentist. We talked, we looked at five different, or well, four counties that are similar to us that are all recruiting for dentists and what they're offering. We also looked at the, uh, the ADA uh, and their salary survey from 2010 uh, that they completed. And right now we're looking at about $113,000 to get a dentist in here. That's about a 10% increase over what we're offering now. We're offering right at about 138. Um, the county manager and I agreed the last time when we made the last offer at 105, uh, and that person turned us down. Um, the county manager and I also talked about a, a moving allowance um, between five and eight thousand um, dollars. We we think we need to implement that. And these are things that are not in our budget right now. Um, licensure allowance of about three hundred dollars. Everyone that we talked to, and we've had three on the hook that we've had uh, conversation with, and kind of made two of them kind of unofficial offers. One truly an official offer. Uh, all three of us turned us turned them down, or three of them turned us down, uh, because of the salary, because we didn't have loan forgiveness, and uh, because we didn't provide uh, a moving allowance, and they didn't think that our annual uh, continuing education allowance that we have, which is about fifteen hundred dollars per dentist, was enough, and, uh, and each of them asked for between three thousand and five thousand uh, dollars. So our recommendation is that we make a budget amendment for thirty five hundred dollars for that as well. Uh, the last thing is a proposed sliding fee scale uh, for Dale. As, as Commissioner Beal stated, um, he's gotten uh, phone calls. I've gotten phone calls since we implemented the new sliding fee scale. The reason, or the new uh, fee plan. The reason we implemented the new fee plan was because it's the difference between what it actually costs us to do a procedure and um, what we get in Medicaid cost settlement. Uh, you guys, I guess it's been about two months, approved that fee increase. Um, what we've had is an impact in the community of people who are, who in the previous to that, um, were not Medicaid and who are paying the Medicaid rate for dental service. And what we're trying to do, and, we, and we've also got a sliding fee scale in place in the children's dental program, and we want to make an amendment to that as well because of the fee increase. If you look at the slide you have in front of you, the local health department charge, and there's, there's about 150 charges. I only use three for the example because these are, these are the three primary ones when a patient comes in. But a period, uh, their first exam, which is the first one at the top up there, uh, the local health department charge right now is $38. The Medicaid rate is $28. Uh, and people are having a hard time paying that $38. Uh, what we want to recommend is to get it closer to that Medicaid rate at $26. And for adults, create a sliding fee scale that runs between 100% and 200% of federal poverty. Uh, and there is a slide in your packet there that uh, describes the federal poverty level and, and the family size. Um, what that would make is for a patient who is 50% paid, who is 100% of federal poverty to 149% of federal poverty, that would make that visit $19. And for a patient who is 75% pay, we would make that, at, I think it's $29. I should have made this a little bigger. Um, anybody above 200% of federal poverty would be 100% pay uh, in the system would pay $38 for that visit. That's the adult dental plan. Uh, for the and it extrapolates out like that for every single one of the fees that we have for the adult dental program. The children's dental program will run into the same thing. We've got parents that are calling uh, and canceling their children's appointments because we increased the fee uh, to $38 for that visit as well. Uh, and what we're recommending is to bring that back down closer to the Medicaid rate. Uh, to we, we currently slide the children's program down to 40% of federal poverty. Um, what we're recommending is to slide that to 25% of federal poverty uh, and it brings it back down to where it was at almost where it was at 40% uh, uh, pay before, um, which means that a 25% pay patient will be paying $10 uh, for that visit, 50% uh, pay will be paying 19, and 75% pay will be paying 29. And anybody 250% of federal poverty or more would be 100% pay and be paying all $38. Um, if you want uh, to see real quick what that means um, for federal federal poverty guideline. Uh, a family size of four at 100% pay is $55,000 a year in annual income. Uh, 
and most, a lot of the ones we're seeing in adult are folks without children, um, though we do have some that have children. 100% um, pay uh, for them uh, is um, $29,419 for family and two. So you can see we're trying to push it down to where the median income and make it is and, uh, and make this more affordable for those who are fee-for-service patients. The other thing that we, the point that I need to make about that is that if we go to this sliding fee scale in adult, it doesn't change the amount we budgeted for this year for revenue and fees in adult dental clinic because we based it on the Medicaid rate at the beginning of the year before we implemented those fee changes. So if we can see the same number of patients and we can charge them the rate similar to the Medicaid rate, with the sliding fee scale in place, we should still be able to earn the same revenue that we had projected originally, which is about $85,000, if we can get people in the door and have a dentist full time. <coughs> That's it. You know what I'm understanding to you guys, is under you know, the Medicaid the state's wisdom that if they invest in keeping good dental health, to me, that, that that's a good investment that would save them money down yeah, the road. Yeah. A whole lot more than what they're and, and to coin something that Commissioner Collins said, they, and I wrote it down, is that, um, you know, when your teeth hurt, you, you want to get seen. And if we don't have the care in the adult dental program, they're going to show up in the emergency room. It's going to cost us twice the money. And guess what? You're not going to get to see it happen. <coughs> You're going to be seeing the emergency room physician who's going to do what? Give you an antibiotic and send you out the door. So you're not gonna get, exactly, you're not going to get your tooth taken care of. Uh, so the cost in the end of the Medicaid is going to be exponentially That's higher what I don't than what it is now to leave the Medicaid program. This is another one of those examples here when they say this budget is going to get a nice. Well, the state cut that out. I mean, that was a, you know, we, I sat down list of this discussion, and there was no discussion. Flam, bam, vote, gone. Not even committee meeting. Um, so, the, so what we're asking is for three things tonight. Uh, one is, is current sustainability. Uh, future funding is an issue that we can address as we go through the budget. Um, option one, mothball the clinic doesn't cost the county anything, but nobody gets dental services. And in the end, it costs us all because they're going to go to the doctor. Um, so we're asking for a funding commitment from the county. Uh, initially, of the 50, uh, I should put my slide out, 50, Three thousand uh, dollars that we can do a budget amendment for and submit uh, through the process. The second one is um, to approve uh, our recruitment retention idea. Uh, the the one thing we do uh, want to not miss in considering that is that it's not just the dentist that we're trying to recruit. We need to look at and influence um, them coming. But if we influence them coming, we pay them the same rate that we're paying the current dentist who's been here uh, consistently for about six years. Um, we may lose another dentist, and so whatever adjustment we need, we make in the entry salary for the one, we need to make it. The, uh, we recommend that we make in the uh, sure. the second in the existing dentist. How many full-time dentists have we have we had since we started the program? Um, adult dental, three. Uh, one who they hired who never saw a patient um, before he left. One. Uh, David Oliver, who was here about a year, and almost two years, I guess, and then Dr. Council, who was here about a year. And the children's program, I really don't know how many total they had. I know they had Dr. Chang, and they had uh, Moral Dr. Morales before Dr. Chang, and I think they might have been another dentist before. Dyer. 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 So I think it is you'll bring up the children. Children's dental health has been in existence longer. Children's dental program, yeah, they've actually had a dental program. They started the molar rolling, I guess, 2000, 2001 with a grant. Um, but prior to that, they actually had a mobile unit that went to the schools. I don't know exactly how it worked. It was way before my time. I don't that was on a bench like ground off. Since two, July of 2007. They saw their first patient in July of 2007. Yeah. Or, excuse me, January 2007. The things that we're talking about here really are focused on adult dental. Child dental is still mm -hmm. solvent. Child dental is still solvent. Um, we, we do need to look at the sliding fee scale adjustment for child dental, and that's the third thing down here is implementation of this new sliding fee scale in, in children's dental, which slides it a little bit further and gets it back down closer to what they were paying prior to the fee increase. The fee increase, again, is for that Medicaid cost settlement that it may only be another year that we get it. Um, and we'll have to look at adjusting the fees again and, and what you guys want to subsidize if that goes away. 
as far as both the adult program and the children's program. Mm -hmm. I sure down to the What I'm wrestling with is what you mentioned uh, earlier that <coughs> the, uh, the other dentists in town are lowered their fees to be competitive. So, I mean, I, what I'm trying to, what I'm wrestling with is well, if other dentists are competitive on the project to start with, do we need to be in the adult The only thing that matters is the Medicaid. They they don't that's the key. So dentists other are dentists are not accepted. I agree with Brian. You got you got private dentists out there that look for business. Well, need, all you got to do is open the press. The problem there is Jim, correct me if I'm wrong. The problem there is private dentists don't like dealing with Medicaid. They don't, they don't like dealing with Medicaid. Medicaid. They don't like dealing with the uninsured necessarily. The problem is the big problem is it's a long term problem for the county. If you if we mothball the program now and said we're not going to see another patient, we're going to leave it to the private dentist to pick up the, the load now. Is just like what I talked about the other day with immunizations and the pharmacists. They'll pick up that piece today because it makes them some money because they're hurting. But two years from now or three years from now when the economy picks up and we don't have a dental program, they're not going to be seeing those patients in their clinics anymore. And who's going to be stuck with the hand with the bill at that point again is going to be the commissioners. And, uh, and I know it's your decision, the taxpayers, but the decision to, to fund it and, and start it back up again with you guys. So, so what have you seen as far as Dentist, and that's and maybe Professor Roberti mentioned. You, you've got student trial school. You have a lot of debt. You need to pay that off. Well, you have established dentists who are not going to. They're not going to be able to establish practice. So you're looking at mostly kids right out of school. You're looking you're at mostly school. new graduates, or or there are some public health minded dentists out there. And uh, and we, two of the three that we talked to recently, I think would have probably been long term folks if we could have gotten them on. And they were someone who was in a private practice. They were no, they were dentists right out of school. But, and, okay. and there is, you know, it, if we hire somebody, we have a dentist right now that's come to us that's working a day or two a week, and uh, he is seeing patients just like he would in his private practice. He's full speed ahead. Um, and then we have other dentists that are brand new graduates who graduated back in May. And yes, they're working in private practice now, but when they come in, their speed is way down here compared to that guy. Where he sees 13 or 14 a day, they're seeing six or seven. Um, and it, all, it, it has to do with speed and experience, and that'll build. But anytime we hire a new dentist, just like with an environmental specialist or anybody else, there's that learning curve that we have um, to where they can build up to issue a permit or they can build a do. And those, those students right out of school, the average one of those has probably $150,000 a day, would you say? The ones we spoke to had between 111 and 130. You know what really gets me? That if you're incarcerated in prison, you get that free dental care <laughs> to the max. That's what drives me crazy. And yet, then we got people, Maconians, that need this service. That, uh, I'm, I'm just, one of the other one of the other points we discuss as a board is the reason loan forgiveness is important is we felt like that could be a hook for retention, so that we don't have get a revolving that, door. Get that new Right. And so when's he graduate? He's his first year. But this first year cost him slash us uh, $40,000. $40,000. And that's not living expenses. That's not your food. That's not buying. Then they say, oh, you've got to get these little magnifying glass glasses. They're 1200 bucks. This shit is it's a tremendous. Unless you come from a very wealthy family, my son does not. <laughs> Those kids come out with a lot of debt. And, and the federal loan program, the state and federal loan program pays between 80 and 100,000 dollars, 80 and 100,000 dollars over a three to five year period, depending on which one they get. If you, if you come to a certain area with a certain need, correct, they'll forgive your. They get started to start give uh, portions. You got to stay at what three years before you get it. Um, well, you get it's it's you get it a piece at a time, small piece at the beginning, big balloon at the end, to um, keep you there. and uh, to keep you there for that. Depending on which one you get, it's four or five years. Not three, five, four or Mr. Five Chairman, years. even with the sliding scale and, and, and the rates going up, I mean, I'm just speaking for myself, sitting here looking for 53,000. I think we're all going to have to, if, if, if the big money goes away, Jim, we we'll really have to get in or out. There'll be other decisions. There's going to be another right. decision either we get in or out. But, I, but, but for now, for the services this provides the community, uh, there's some things that I certainly don't understand. It's not our fault, it's not the health department. I, 
I really don't see how we can abandon the program of mothballing. I think it's going too far down the road. Too many of our citizens depend on it. And, uh, and you know, because our numbers, as Jane Kennedy will tell you right quick, our, our Medicare and Medicaid numbers keep doing it. It's not on a plane like this. It's on a plane like this. And those are the folks that want to be served. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just, you know, for the $53,000, and I would ask Jim to keep us posted. But I think there's going to come a time that this board and the health department will decide are we going to get in or out. Are we going to have yeah. a nice facility with enough chairs to do it? Because you can do it right. If you do this in the right way, that, and that's the point I would make. If you do this in the right way, you're paying an enough to, to make it worth him to come here. Uh, your your <coughs> program is working. You have that, what did you say, seven chairs? You're making, I'm hearing you say it's a, it's a positive cash flow account. It is right. Well, I'm renting the office with eight chairs and a whole lot cheaper than my chair. But, but we, but the thing, I, but the thing I'm doing, I mean, we're, I mean, it's nice to make money, but we're not necessarily trying to make money. Well, I, mean, I, I, would be, I would be overjoyed at a break. And, and let me clarify that. Yeah. If, if you're doing this thing in, I'm not saying doing it wrong, but if you're doing it in a way that it's maximizing the effort, then it's at least a break even. We want it to be revenue neutral. Have you ever brought in a professional consultant, a dental consultant? We don't have that. I mean, you have a veterinarian who's one of the programs. And uh, who, who, who runs the program? The veterinarian? The dentist runs the program. But I mean, have you ever brought in a professional consultant that says, I mean, I've built several dentist offices. The dentist does not tell you how to run the program. You bring in a consultant, either yeah. Patterson or some of these others, and they, and they give you ideas on how you can be more right. efficient. That was not done when they opened us that dental program. Has it ever been done? Not with that adult dental program, no. no I, think that, that I, I think that's that's one of the things that the health would you consider. That, that's what somebody, I'm saying. If you don't don't stay stay this, have to be you want to to make money. You need to do it the right way with the right number of chairs with maximizing your effort, creating at least a revenue neutral system. There might be some things they could do right now. A professional consultant can do. I mean, I'm, I'm, just to me personally, uh, I mean, I, I'm willing to, to, if we need to, almost a lot of money right now, I'm willing to kick in the 53 or whatever it is to get us through the rest of this year. But come budget time, we're going to have to look at it again. But I can tell you, if we're looking at $240 million a year, uh, that's just something that, I, I mean, I, I'll just go through. I just can't see us doing that. If, if, the 50, if, if, if we're looking at it as a 53,000 is buying us some time for the rest of this year to see if we can work, for lack of better terminology, work the kinks out, I, I could go along with that. But I can tell you, a quarter million, 200, quarter million. But even with the changes to Medicare, Ryan, I, I, and Jim, I really feel that somewhere down the line, somebody's going to say, you know, let's look at this thing. You know, if we, if we invest here, or these folks here, they might save us tons of money on the back side if they don't have quality dental care now, what's it going to cost us three years down the road, four years down an emergency room cost? And if they're on Medicaid. Well, 50, well, 50, well 50, if you don't have proper dental care, you're talking about heart conditions, you're talking about but the all kinds of medical conditions that follow. That buy us a little time. Well, to me, to so, me, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, we're talking about a minimum of 53. It could be 105. could be just for the rest of this year. And are you right. talking about to the end of the fiscal year? This, 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 budget, budget, this budget, 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 half a year, this budget, to the end of June. Here's, here's what it boils down to. If, we, if we're not willing to say we're out tonight, then it's no way. We're going to have to, we're going to have to pony up. Unless we're willing, because, because <coughs> realistically, if you, if, if you bob bob and you think $200,000 a year is tough, if you sustain what you have, if you try to start over, my guess is it's going to be significantly more than $200,000. So my feeling is, I don't think any, and I can't speak to the rest of the board. I'm not willing to get out tonight. So if we're not going to get out tonight, I'd go along with Mr. Bill and say, we've got to bite the bullet for a swallow real hard. I know I like the way the medicine tastes, but it keeps you in the game, at least to the end of the fiscal year. We've got too much invested up to this point. But I do think it gives us an opportunity to do some things, you know, to have some people look at it, and I think it's going to come a time when it came out. And, and, that, and that may well be the And story. I'm not willing to, you know, even though I think it's our responsibility for, the, for, the, for the, our citizens. I, th I think something that you're going to have to look at, too, is recruitment and retention. 
if we are not able to pay the dentist what the other counties are paying, we're never going to get our full-time dentist. Yeah, that's, and that's a Do you know those comparisons, Roberta? Well, Jim brought some of them out there earlier, and, and we had the one dentist that probably we, we could have got, but we didn't. In other words, they turned us down because our salary was not comparable to some of the other counties. They went elsewhere. And the loan forgiveness. And the lo right, that and well, the loan forgiveness. What, what about Jackson County? Some, some, some of the counties don't, don't have a dental. What they'll have done is most all counties got into the dental program several years ago when I was involved with it, and we did in an adjoining county. We, we did it at that time because of the, of the demand and the need to have children covered under dental care and so that they can be prepared so they can function in school and so forth. That was where the emphasis started out. Right. Now, a lot of the counties have not expanded into adult <coughs> dental. Is that right? right? Well, well, there was a few adult state with the child dental, and it, it made it work uh, without having additional appropriation from local resources. So we're not, it's not like it's in every county. They're, they're, and there's some counties who have very little dental service. I'm not playing it down, but I know I've talked to some of the managers over in the other western counties. They have a dental clinic twice a month. Two days a month is all they the share between That's two right. counties. Two days in one county, two yeah. days in the other. So, so we, 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 we have, we have, we have a really good program, and it's, and it's been nice to be able to, uh, be able to uh, provide that and sustain it based on the revenues and the fees that you collect. But I think you're going to have to take a hard look at it uh, in the future. If it's going to cost you more than that, uh, you really have to have a, a solid, compelling reason to stay in it. I think the only compelling reason to stay in it going to have a future with the manager would be if, if they come in the week, if they, if they pull the big block of money, then it changes the whole record. Yeah. I did, you just have to think that somebody may go back and tell they ain't got no sense. Forget the money. Well, we've demonstrated it, it was generating a positive cash flow into the county. And we feel like if we we can get a full-time dentist with the things we talked about that we can be revenue neutral or continue to generate positive cash flow. Uh, I mean, that's where the, the board is. Well, that's right. That's the bottom line. But we can do it, you know, in a revenue neutral that way. That thing is half part of a leader across the state and everything. But if you set, that, if you set that, that salary, the problem is you don't have a consistent, you don't have a consistent person there. That's, that's, right. Right. that's right. That's creating the problem. That's, that's, the, that's the big problem. So, so yeah, that's problem number one. That's that's right. a one a. So so if you if you have that competitive salary, you put it put that at a level where you're going to get that person. And put the number of chairs there to maximize their efficiency. If you get efficiency. the right number of chairs, then this problem solves itself because now you're now you have a positive cash flow revenue. Control. It's got that potential, Kevin. Yeah. And when they when they take that two hundred thousand dollars away. I mean, I, you know, I, that's, that's, uh, that's why we've kind of been sitting where we are in the building we are without really pushing any buttons. We've applied for a couple of grants to try and do a trailer mobile unit, um, like a uh, trailer with five chair mental clinic in it and some other stuff that didn't pan out. But um, we're just kind of sitting where we are, biding our time to see what happens. And it, it, it's so it's can you, can you, can you work in cooperation with the existing dentist office? Have you pursued that? <laughs> We done tried that. Been down that road. And uh, sent letters to every. Been down that road and sent letters to every single dental practice in in Western North Carolina and those licensed dentists uh, a little further over the line and uh, we got response from who know from Cam. Well, as Jim, one of the big problems is the fees that the charge to private patients is nowhere close to what you get reimbursed from Medicaid for. So even if you had a dentist who was willing to do it. Yeah, they ask you to pay the full fee, and all you would have is the uh, Medicaid reimbursement, which would cover. Yeah, and I can tell you, there's one dentist in the community that's taking Medicaid patients. He ain't figured it out yet, but he will, and he'll stop. And eventually, once his practice is built, he will do the same thing the other dentists should do. He's the guy that's got the cheap rent. He's the guy that's got the cheap rent on Swan Road, right? <laughs> he got a real deal on the whole dentist side of his building. He got chairs and all. <laughs> but, uh, and we have a whole, by the way, we have a whole storage room full of chairs. Well, I mean, really, the Rotary does. It, it, but the crux of the question you I think the that we can <coughs> give you some input on tonight is we either mothball the program, which costs us no additional money, or we agree to spend the necessary funding, which is, at best case, 53000 give or take, and at worst case, a, bit, a little bit over 100000 for the next seven and a half months. Make sure we got
got seven months left in this fiscal year, in this, in this budget fiscal year. So what I would, and I'd be glad to make the motion, that we appropriate, uh, we appropriate uh, the minimum of, of, of $53,000. We'll let ask Mr. Brutner to come back and give us a report uh, probably in February <coughs> to see where we're at with our 53000 and just see where we're at by that time. I thought I'm protecting for a second. You know what I just said? <laughs> so we have a motion to appropriate up to basically $53,000, kind of almost half a quarter of the year, if we will. We'll have Mr. Uh -huh. Brooks come back February and report to us. We've got a second. Uh, and I'll put a caveat up that we're showing you. And if you need to come back before that, Jim, if you see that this thing ain't going to get us through, through January the 10th, I mean, that's where you and the staff that, will that get us the dentist. If we can get the dentist, then we will reevaluate it. So if, so if by then you have a dentist and you end up running at full speed, then chances are you're not going to be able to fire. Yeah. Chances are we won't need to. If it, there's, there's little things that need to occur. We get a dentist, we are paying that dentist about $6,000 a month more than we're paying. We would pay a salary dentist, which is the $53,000. Our hopes are that that dentist, that we can recruit somebody that's going to be a dentist who's got some speed on them and can generate the revenue necessary to make it through the year. If they generate where Dr. Council was, who is a <coughs> graduate, we're going to be 5000 short a month through the year. That adds to that $53,000 times seven, $5,000. Something we've not even talked about is, is these patients that are dependent on being service. If we mothballed it at any time, we're still going to have to put out some money for whatever it takes to find these folks over here. I think we owe that this week. Um, the other, the other, <coughs> there are two other things that we need to get opinion on. One is the recruitment <coughs> retention. And Can the we vote on this money first? Sure. I'm sorry. I thought you were getting ahead of myself. Yeah, because the next thing is about recruitment <laughs> retention and salary. That's a different topic. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we've got a motion by Commissioner Bill, a second by Commissioner Corbin. That we uh, appropriate up to, I'll call it, let's call it 54000 and round it out uh, for the remainder of this year. Uh, with the understanding that uh, Mr. Brock will come to us in February and give us an update uh, and, and to get us through the rest of this fiscal year. That's the motion on the table. we got a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion on that? The motion to include the appropriation on the table. Okay, so we got a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, proceed by by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Director says aye. Okay, our next item is recruitment and retention. And, and we are in, a, in, in the dental world in a slump only because you don't have a lot of dentists in private practice looking to leave private practice. Uh, and there's not many new graduates out there who are looking for a job. Um, that's not going to occur probably till February, March. And you're probably not going to get them in here if it is a new graduate until uh, July. <coughs> well, they'll graduate in May, but they usually don't want to start right off the bat. Um, come time on yeah, they want to start that first day of the graduate. Mm -hmm. um, so <coughs> the potential is, is that it could take us all the way to July before we actually have somebody in place. It would be nice if we had if we if we did find somebody between now and then, uh, and we are uh, going to continue to beat the bushes for that. Um, however, it does, it, our rec the recommendation of the, the ad hoc committee is um, to look at a, a salary increase of 10% over what we actually offer now um, for both the incoming dentist and the existing dentist. Is it 113 uh, what we offer? That's up to now 113. Right now we offer 103, and uh, the matter of fact, got us, had conversations to take it to 105 uh, and got turned down by the last person. And the recommendation of the ad hoc committee after looking at the four other counties and looking at the ADA information that we had, um, the recommendation was to take it to 113 uh, and to take the existing dentist to 127, I think it is. Yeah, that's what you had to yeah. Where did that recommendation come from? Uh, it was part of the conversation with the ad hoc committee. The recommendation came from this, the staff and looking at those four counties yeah. and, the, uh, and the ADA's uh, information. So, but I guess the point that is that there's no guarantee that you're going to get with someone even for that. There is no guarantee that even for that. So, as much as it pains me to say this, uh, I, I mean, 
I mean, we can vote on this, and we, I guess we, we, we need to, but to me, if we just voted for $54,000, to me, that's a no-brainer, because it sure, you know what, I'm going to get a dentist, but I mean, we demonstrated that we're not going to get a dentist. Yeah, but we can vote on it. Yeah, but we can vote on it. Yeah, but we can vote on it. That's a recommendation of the Board of Health. That's who's the way we're going about it. We'll sit here. Let me ask a question. So we have a question like this, Jim. The, the adjustment, the 10% adjustment, is, is on the salary range for uh, the, the salary that we're looking for to recruit. And also, if that works out, then we have a 10% increase to the existing. To the existing, yes. Yeah. yeah. The second one doesn't occur to the first one. What if we don't get a dentist? Are you going to go ahead and <laughs> Then we're coming back again to you, probably. Um, our, we would only do that, that to maintain, maintain child dentists if, yeah. if that became an issue. Yeah. Children's dental is, yeah. is the key, and that was the ad hoc committee made that absolutely clear. Yeah. If, uh, if the world yeah. fell apart tomorrow yeah. right. and we lost all the optional services for Medicaid uh, and, and yeah. Medicaid, yeah. we're still going yeah. to. Yeah. The ad hoc committee says they still want to be able to try and see kids right. um, and take care of the kids. One clarification: we we approved the fifty-four thousand dollars, which as soon as that. That's what you're asking us to address. You're asking us to allow you to make this offer to the next dentist we try to recruit. So far, no money's changing hands, so that'll be probably next year's budget anyway. But what you want our concurrence on is that you can go out and offer that money. Offer that money. It's either going to be... And then we'll have to go back and we'll have to approve that money, but we have to give them the authorization. We're not, we're not up in other guys' salary until we show, till we show, show that. And it, and it would either come in the form of a budget amendment once we make the offer and the offer is accepted, uh, for the two positions to have that increase or would come as part of the budget process if it didn't work out. Mr. Chairman, when you're right, you're right, right, I'll make a motion that we authorize the health department to offer the benefit package recommended to the applicant as in the recruitment process. We're going to have a motion for the health second. Did you say it, Mr. Hankin? We're going to have a motion and a second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. I have a question. Sure, sure. Make sure I understand. Questions you want. <coughs> when that happens, you'll have to come back immediately, I think. I'll have to submit. Well, that's got to happen quick. I mean, if you if you're buying a car, say I'll give you X amount of dollars for this car, you won't have the cash money to do it with. So when, when that happens, how, how, what's the time frame? Of that? If it occurred between now and the end of this fiscal year, we would have to look at the fifty-three thousand dollars that you've appropriated towards the contract dentist and make an adjustment. And more than likely, it would be take a budget amendment. Take take the majority yeah. of it, if not all, of that. and then come back and ask us to. And then we would, make then that. then it would okay. become a part of the budget. So you would have the flexibility. You would need to execute the deal. Correct. Yeah, okay. And if we and if we had, depending on how far out into the year we get, it may be that we'd have to come back and say right. This now, when you recruited this, this you going to tell say, I'm recruiting you and we're offering you this money, but we don't have a Chinaman's change to get this baby if this money don't come through. I mean, you're going to have to be pretty much up front with we've whoever you're recruiting. We've been real up front with the folks that we talked to. You have to. And that's, a, that's another hurdle. That hurts, too. Mm -hmm. We've been very much up front with the people that we talked to. Okay. Well, okay, so. No. Yeah. Okay, so we're, we're getting okay. a vote on that. We got, we got a motion. A second. All in favor, please speak by by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? My last question is before you get to the next thing. As far as the uh, Medicaid optional and the other piece, will we know the fate of that money during our budget process? No, um, we probably won't know it all. When do we July, know it this time? This time we found out in August. And, right. and they, we, well, August they, 18th. They made the decision in August on, on how to do it. Medicaid made the decision, but they didn't pass it to anybody and get it approved until September. 
I guess it looks like we made a So you can be flying them seat of your pants, you just have to put a caveat in there. Right? You know, we just have to act loud when he comes. Nobody knows. Okay. So you know they're not going to drop it. Oh, yeah, we're fine with that. That's what they said the other day. Sorry. Uh, the third thing is implementation of a sliding key scale in both vehicles. <coughs> implementation of a sliding key scale in adult dental and uh, re reducing the sliding key scale to 40 from 40 in the children's dental. And that would work like a three example. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. And, and again, just a point of clarification that does, we did budget a specific set amount of money based on the Medicaid rate in fees this year for our self pay clients. This does not reduce those charges but maybe a dollar or two more on certain visits below and a dollar or two more above, depending on where they fall on the sliding fee scale. So the estimations for this budget year remain the same. Our only challenge in adult dental is we've got to get somebody in there to generate those fees. Right. Um, but children's dental, we're still, you know, we're just now starting to see those hiccups of people calling and saying, I can't bring my kid in because it's going to cost me $38 and two months ago it cost me 10 So that's what we're running into. This term and I would argue that the sliding fee scale is, a, is an integral part of loan forgiveness, which is an integral part of what we just authorized the for to do. For what it's worth, that's the way I see it. They're locked in the head. You can't do one without the other. You just, you basically just said we were going to do that when you, when we voted on the recruitment and retention. Is that a motion? That is a motion. Is that a motion and a second on implementation of sliding fee scale? Any other questions regarding that? Hearing none, all those voters will signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Let the record show that carries you now. So. Any other comments? Yeah, yeah, one more point of clarification that now that I've been steady thinking about it for a while. When you were talking about hiring a consultant to come in, um, prior to my time, but I know that it did occur, um, when David Oliver was first hired as our dentist here, Patterson Dental did come in and look at the adult dental clinic where it is and help configure that clinic. Help Side where the chairs went, where the x ray units went. In fact, Patterson Dental had to come in and install the x rays. County Nations couldn't install the x ray units. So they did consult with Patterson on a lot of the stuff. Uh, the computer system is an Eagle Soft computer system, which is a Patterson, Patterson's billing system. Patterson came in, did all the training for all of the dental staff, Dr. Oliver. Uh, I would revisit Patterson. He was well. asking for a uh, and And part of it, you know, depending on how things go with the way they do optional services is that I've already had conversations with folks at Casey Reynolds and they're interested in our adult dental program because they know we're making money on it and the other counties aren't doing that uh, because we're doing it the right way. And uh, and they expressed interest in the future as if we were looking to expand in helping to offset potentially we have to fly just like anybody else, the cost of equipment and stuff, just like they did when we built the equipment when they I would be this, and there's more than just Patterson too that you can contact. And I can give you a whole list of them. We've had funks office, we use different ones. Who and how we use different ones. When we read down the instant large, we use different ones. So there's several different. Well, they used the group out of Atlanta when they first started the building the money, and that's who sold them all that third world. I guess maybe the people that have knocked them. That we had to come up But a dental office is not, it's not about anything else in the world. Oh, no, no. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, for taking the time to be here. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sorry. Thank you, Ron. Good to see you. I went back to a bedtime. I know it. And I hadn't had dinner either. I have to email to you too, so thank you. Everybody has to join me. Yeah, we can probably. Okay, I'm going to work on this road. I'm going to work on this resolution. Okay, our next item of business on new business is uh, we have a resolution uh, that we need to adopt for multi-year addition measure mitigation. The reason is that we need to do this is because uh, the state just passed a uh, general statute 166A, and in order for us to be able to be eligible for funds, we have to have a, a, a hazard mitigation plan. Otherwise, we can't get federal or state assistance in the event of a hazard. And so that's what this is, is for us to have an updated plan is a resolution adopting a multi jurisdictional uh, hazard mitigation plan. So, uh, if you believe it's appropriate, gentlemen, I'll read it into the record. Uh, Mr. Attorney, you think that's appropriate? Or we'll waive the reading, Mr. Attorney. I put it in the window. 
Yeah, we're approving the same plan we already approved. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So you approve that? Okay. Because otherwise, we're not going to be eligible for state assistance. Correct. Okay. Uh, we have a motion we accept it. You say We have a motion and a second. I have a motion, Ronnie, second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? That's the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That was this item is of 10 C. This is item 10 D, economic development. Mr. Chairman, uh, as we uh, are all well aware, uh, the departure of our uh, county employee worked with us on economic development. We looked at a way uh, to uh, fill that gap, uh, discussed it with the Economic Development Commission, and uh, informed of the board commissioners, and the decision was made to recommend that we uh, fill the rest of the, this fiscal year uh, with on a contract basis. And so we negotiated, we had several, uh, uh, I think about three that an interest in it, uh, did uh, get serious negotiations, and we're happy to report that uh, Tommy Jenkins, who is, uh, you all I know probably know Mr. Jenkins, he's been in the county all his life almost, and uh, former uh, member of Advantage West, chairman of that group, uh, quite a number of years, uh, uh, has a lot of experience in uh, economic development projects, uh, working with the state, working with the region. So we're able to uh, negotiate a contract with Mr. Jinx to take over the responsibilities of uh, managing our economic development activities work with our economic development commission for the balance of this year. Uh, the uh, draft that you have there in front of you is a contract that was uh, drawn by County Attorney Jones and reviewed by myself. It's also been reviewed by Mr. Jenkins. Uh, made a few minor changes to it, but everybody's in agreement that it's, it's, a, good, it's a good agreement for the balance of this year. Specific terms, uh, and generally speaking, is that uh, uh, the cost of the county would be uh, $5,000 a month, uh, would be all inclusive of uh, the expenses for Mr. Jenkins. Uh, he covers all expenses. He covers all of his own expenses in the county. He has travel outside the county, the county business, the county would reimburse him for mileage or actual expenses out of pocket. Also, we do have agreed to uh, allow him uh, $100 a month as an allowance for cellular service and uh, data service because he basically takes his office with him wherever he is in or out of the office or out of the county. And so uh, we do have uh, an agreement with him to accept that if the board approves it. And there is enough money in the existing Economic Development Commission budget that will not require us to make a budget adjustment for this is year. He got his own office for you for the office, the, office, uh, the office that we're using now is on our hall next to our office and he's, he has use of it, has access and use of and uh, uh, copy machines, uh, telephone service inside the county building, and so forth. And uh, he'll uh, he'll be working closely with me on a daily basis, along with the economic development commission and the board. And so our recommendation tonight is for the board to actually go ahead and approve and authorize us to execute the contract for uh, 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 services for Mr. Uh, Thomas Jenkins. Sometime before June 30th, obviously during budget preparation, we decide that this is a continuing pro <coughs> program, uh, and if so, what the uh, what the cost may be for the, for the next year. We've all been discussed and worked out uh, several months prior to the end of this fiscal year. Just one point of clarification: uh, the contract would actually be with New South Strategies LLC, which is uh, managed by Thomas K. Jenkins. He's the key employee. That's he is, that's he is company. company. He is. But that's the contract will be like the John says. The contract will be between the company name, not him and the business. And just to point out, Mr. Manager, one of the things that this board insisted on, and, and I'm glad to see that it's supported so well, Chester, on page five on double C, that it shall report monthly to the Maine County Economic Development Commission, the manager of the County Amador County Commission regarding the status of all economic development business critical projects being conducted by it. So and if you want more reports, you're entitled to them. Well, and I think that that's one thing that, that we look forward to. Because we all said, you know, 
Big Mama Bill is not like being a big keep it behind you with an ANC. I think uh, <coughs> I think this is a very positive move for the county and uh, did a very good job of, of writing it up, Mr. John. And Mr. Big has got the experience of political experience and the Bank West experience and he's been five years in the real estate person and certainly be worth the best contract in the rest of the year and he's sad that you take a look at him. He's been in the real estate business pretty <coughs> much all his uh, career and I always said the key element that's necessary for a person to be successful in economic development is that they've got to be able to sell.
think executive privilege will say, I think we can all agree it's a good idea for Macon County for us to have some representation. And, I, and I'm willing, to be, if we want you got to be able to read, though. you got to be able to read before you get set to the position. So, uh, <laughs> so does it, would, would, I'll take a volunteer for this if someone would like to do that. And it probably is good, actually, well, all you guys are in town all the time, I guess. So first, I think a lot of the meetings that get out are at Franklin Library or something like that. Is, is there, they they rotate. They, they, may be, they may have one in Jackson County. Mike filled in for us at one of the meetings they had over Jackson County. And uh, there may be another meeting in Swain County. But, but, but honestly, guys, it is a, it is a very important Things we need to do, <clears throat> and I, I don't mind trying to probably get a mess not to have that in the past. Do, Kevin would like to have an opportunity to meet quarterly. If you would like me to get some more information, if you don't want to make a decision tonight, we can do that. You can make the appointment at your December meeting, but uh, we have to go ahead and move on it sometime in the next month. Okay, we don't have to meet again. Uh, I, I, I will do that in December, and gentlemen. We'll have the straws in closed session. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, when the next item we have is uh, we've got a request uh, for a closed session. Uh, do we have a motion? Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm not sure the county attorney is going to have it. Perfect. Give it. Well, that would be a great American. <laughs> okay. All right. If we, don't, if we don't have any further business. Well, can I ask a question, sir? Major, uh, just to clarification of where we are with our emergency services? Application for that, the sorting. Of where is where is that? We're in the interviews right now, so hopefully with it before you, before the next uh, ten days, uh, we should have that resolved. Are you here? How many how many applications do you have? I think we have about uh, twenty-five to twenty-eight, something like that. We're not going to interview all those, only the ones that meet the qualifications. Okay. And so hopefully we'll finish the interviews. How many? How many people interview? Yeah. Probably six. Mr. Chairman, before we close, any other questions for me? Before we close, you, Mr. Chairman, I think we need to put in the minutes uh, that this board recognizes two things. One thing is uh, this coming Friday is Veterans Day. That's one. And uh, Mr. Cupper, on behalf of this board, we thank you. We thank you for the veterans of Macon County, and especially those who gave off. And uh, we need to, I'd like to have that reflected in the minutes. We recognize Veterans Day as uh, not just another day, but it's a special day that we wouldn't be here tonight without that day. And the second thing is uh, with Thanksgiving come up in the economy, uh, thanks to the school board and working, I know we own the school, but you know, but, uh, there are several churches that's going to be feeding Thanksgiving meals. One will be on the 20th, and starting at uh, 1 o'clock at the new school. Uh, estimates this church will probably feed, but he could be a we have 200 people. So this is in our community, folks. This ain't. This is not Mecklenburg County. This is not. No, this is in our community. So uh, this Thanksgiving, we should all give thanks. But let us remember those uh, Maconians out there who's not having such a good Thanksgiving. And if you get a chance to drop by, some of these folks are going to have more than Highlands too. <coughs> so uh, if we get an opportunity to stop by and see these folks on Thursday, and thank these churches. I think, going to, I think this can be left a little more and more to groups, different groups. Uh, not only city organizations that are part of it, Brian and, and, and Kevin and Ron. Bobby would be the at time. So I just think that this Thanksgiving is uh, it, it's a little bit different than a lot of those in our community. So I think we need to, to remember those folks and go out and have an opportunity to thank these people for what they're doing uh, to provide a special service. That I wish we didn't need. Yeah, I also would like to say this too. I know they want us up here and lay off the church Saturdays. Well, it's our dollar to come in some of these churches right here. I'm going to do the same as Sanford. I appreciate you for Sanford too. Some of these bills, I know I'm going this morning. They can set up one of the churches there. They know they have plenty to do. It's a good thing. Just one last quick note before we close, Mr. Chairman. Probably got a uh, notice of an invitation from the Manage West and we should make a lot of trouble. Uh, we've got a reservation for 10 seats at that. If 10 board members are willing to go or able to go next Monday, next Monday, the 14th. We'll no, it's during the day, isn't it? Yeah, and it's yeah. in the evening. Yeah, it's in the evening. Where, 
creating the way I read it, I thought it was during the day. During the day, it starts at, I thought it was at noon time. Yeah, I thought it was right around one of Oh, this is, are you sure? This is this is for the Lakers, Gillis, and Martin Bennett. Yeah, no, not speaker tell us no. Uh, 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 DG Martin from no DG Martin and so forth. Understood it was going to start at five or five thirty. Can you get back Monday. to us on that? If you I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure I'm sure not positive it's at five or five thirty. <laughs> okay. And, and so it'll be at the it's the Diana Wortham Theater in Asheville. They had it last year. Uh, uh, Trevor Dalton and I went to it. it they, they basically have a little heavy hors d'oeuvres thing, and uh, then they have uh, DG Martin. If anybody can go, please let me know and we'll carpool over there. We got several extra seats, but I'll make sure those are filled. Can I have that as Sissy Bill's birthday? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, bring her. her and, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. we, we get out cheap if you do that, right? Yeah, that's, 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 that's a good idea. idea. But if you can go, we certainly like to have you there. Uh, yeah, we got to have a peanut butter. It's real thick. We want to make sure that the, we're re well represented, especially since our new economic development person is the former chairman of that organization. So we we, uh, we have several members from the EDC who are going. Tommy Jenkins is planning on going. I'm planning on going. So if you can, let, let us know tomorrow. The last thing I'd like to say, Mr. Chairman, if I could take just a moment yes, for privilege, uh, this is the first meeting that our new finance director has been with us, Lori. Paul's been here. She's been with us about a, a week today, I think, and uh, she worked all week, and uh, she came back again this morning. So we're, we're glad to have her. She's doing a really good job picking up things fast. It's going to take a while to get up to speed on all of our projects and programs and so forth, but uh, uh, we look forward to working with her. I think she'll do an excellent job.